hosting us this morning for this important conversation. And thank you to all the wonderful organizations and individuals representing our community here today. I'm so excited to be sitting here holding this event in partnership with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Congresswoman Presley has been an incredible advocate for the anti-hunter community for many years when she was a city councilor and including has, as she's been in Congress since 2018. She recognizes the expertise of those who are experiencing food insecurity and always makes time to listen and learn from the community. And then she takes what she hears and learns and translates it into action. Whether it's championing universal school meals, recommending that more people be eligible for SNAP and the amount be increased, to taking to the house floor to ask that meals that serve kids in the school year as well as the summer be given flexibility so that more kids can eat. Congresswoman Presley has prioritized the issue of hunger during her time in office. Today we'll hear from an incredible group of people who will share their own experiences of facing food insecurity and also lift up the innovative community-led solutions happening right here in our backyard to inform a national strategy around ending hunger here in the United States at the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health that will be held this fall. Before I get things over to Congresswoman, I have a few housekeeping items about today's discussion. We'll hear from three panels of experts, community members and those with an experience, community providers, and active advocates and academics. Each panel will be called up one at a time, and the panel will sit together at the table here in front of us. You will give your testimony, and then the congressman will ask any follow-up questions. We will then proceed to the next panel member. Once the panel is finished, the congressman will welcome up the next panel. In order to ensure we hear from everyone who has generously offered their time and expertise today, we ask that you keep your testimony to three minutes. There will be a timekeeper who will enforce the time limit, and we encourage folks to submit more robust comments in writing to Congresswoman Presley's office. So thank you so much, Congresswoman, for your leadership on this issue and for holding this listening session today with, here with all of us. Thank you.
humanitarian crisis. And that is why we are being intentional today about uh, bringing all of you to the table and the deliberate way and the sequencing of how we have formatted today's session. We are going to hear from three panels of experts, community members, providers, advocates, academics, to address the critical question of how to end hunger. For each panel, we are asking everyone to provide, as Aaron indicated, two to three minutes of testimony, which my staff will be recording and synthesizing for submission to the White House Task Force. I will ask follow-up questions when appropriate, but again, this convening is really meant to actively listen to you, to learn from you, and to elevate your voices. We are framing this conversation around five pillars of policy change. First, improve food access and affordability. Second, integrate nutrition and health. Third, empower all consumers to make and have access to healthy choices. Fourth, support physical activity for all. Five, enhance nutrition and food security research. Your testimony here today, again, will be shared word for word with the White House. And in follow-up to our conversation here today, my team and I will submit a report summarizing the impact of the hunger crisis on the Massachusetts Senate. This report will speak to the impact of this crisis, specific actions we need Congress and the White House to take, and highlight work on the ground from our partners that is making a difference for families in our community. With that, I'm happy to welcome our first panel of community members. Again, thank you for being here, uh, especially um, <laughs> those who have known the issue of hunger personally. Um, because unfortunately there is a lot of shame that families carry uh, with the issue of food insecurity and hunger. And again, this is not your failing. This is the result of policy choices. This is a moral failing and humanitarian crisis. So we thank you for being here today. Each panelist will have an opportunity to speak about their experience. And at the end of the panel, again, I will follow up with questions as appropriate. Panelists will be invited or asked to state your name, the city you live in, and then share how hunger has impacted your family and what you recommend policymakers consider doing to address it. We will start from left to right. I need you all to join me uh, here at the podium. Our first panel, uh, can, uh, Jennifer Obadia, uh, Catherine Lynn, Kathy Field, Okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we switched in. I just didn't go back to my notes. Okay, let's start with community members. Ricardo Henley from High Park. Let me just ask that question. Do we want everyone to come up? Or do we yeah. Want okay. Okay. So, can we also have Leah or Tika join us? Elsa Flores, Denise Lowers, Nelsie De La Rosa, and Alba Flores. Okay, okay All right, so we're going to start uh, from left to right. Please speak into the microphone to ensure we capture your testimony, and my staff will give you a gentle reminder when approaching the three minute mark, so we can hear from everyone who has joined us. So this is uh, Eric White, my district director, when you see that uh, fluorescent uh, sign there. Um, don't do what I do, you just ignore it. <laughs> okay? All right. And so we'll begin uh, again from, from left to right. And um, so if you would just state uh, your name, the city you live in. Left to right. Okay. Then. Buenos días a todos. Mi nombre es Elsa Flores. Vivo en el Boston por casi 20 años. Como 
madre, profesional y activista, líder comunitaria en representación de mi comunidad, me siento muy agradecida y orgullosa de ser la voz de mucha gente, especialmente de mi comunidad latina. Um, I'm translating on behalf of Elsa. Um, her name is Elsa Flor. She has lived in East Boston for almost 20 years as a mother, professional, and a community activist leader. And on behalf of her community, I feel very grateful and proud to be the voice of many people, especially my Latino community. Durante mi tiempo viviendo en East Boston, y especialmente durante la pandemia del COVID-19, estando activa en mi comunidad, he podido apreciar el alto nivel de necesidad en recursos y servicios para nuestra gente. Hoy especialmente quiero hablar sobre la inseguridad alimentaria a la que nuestra gente se ha enfrentado durante estos tiempos difíciles. During my time living in East Boston, and especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, being active, in my, being active in my community, I have been able to appreciate a high level of need for resources and services for our people. Today, I especially want to talk about the food insecurity that our people have faced during these difficult times. A pesar de la variedad de recursos existentes en nuestra comunidad, Pienso que es necesario continuar e incrementar el nivel de ayuda, especialmente el recurso de la comida, el cual es una manera de apoyar a nuestra gente más vulnerable. Todos aquellos quienes a pesar de vivir luchando honestamente en esta comunidad, no tienen ningún privilegio de recibir ayudas federales ni estatales debido a su estatus migratorio. Despite the variety of existing resources in our community, I think it is necessary to continue and increase the level of support, especially the food resources, which is a way to support our most vulnerable people. All of those who, despite living struggling in this community, do not have any privilege to receive federal or state aid due to their immigration status. Conozco un excelente recurso, los famosos cupones de alimentos. Para lo cual me gustaría mencionar que algunas de nuestras familias con hijos nacidos en este país pueden tener acceso a ellos, pero lamentablemente el proceso en ocasiones se vuelve muy difícil, tal vez no porque no conozcan el sistema o la forma de cómo aplicar, sino el tipo de trato que algunas personas empleadas del Departamento de Asistencia Transicional DTA o DTA le dan a nuestra gente. He escuchado muchas experiencias desagradables del tipo de atención que allí brinda, motivo por el cual hoy quiero pedir públicamente que haya un mejoramiento en cuanto a ese asunto, que el personal que ahí elabora brinde una atención de calidad, un trato más humano pues todos merecemos ser tratados con dignidad y equidad sin discriminación ni racismo. I know of an excellent resource, the famous food stamps, for which I would like to mention that some of our families with children born in this country can have access to them. But unfortunately, the process sometimes becomes very difficult. Perhaps not because they know the system or how to apply, but the type of treatment that some employees of the DTA department give to our people. I have heard many unpleasant experiences of the type of care they provide there, which is why today I want to publicly ask here for an improvement in this matter, that the personnel who work there provide quality care, a more humane treatment, since we all deserve to be treated with dignity and fairness without discrimination or racism. En conclusión, quiero que mi mensaje llegue desde lo más profundo de mi corazón y con el único propósito de mejorar para que nuestra gente más vulnerable, quienes ya están enfrentando dificultades por la inseguridad alimentaria, no tengan que sufrir ningún tipo de situación desagradable cuando se enfrentan al sistema solicitando algún tipo de ayuda. También agradecer a la ciudad de Boston, YNCA, C-Plan, 
Group WOM, representante estatal Adrián Madaro, concejal Julia Mejía, senadora Lidia Edwards, NOA y la colaborativa de Chelsea por todo el apoyo que brindaron en respuesta de peticiones de apoyo en donación de comida durante los días más difíciles de pandemia y que a través de la iglesia Faro de Luz estuvimos distribuyendo comida para nuestra gente en la comunidad. Gracias a la congresista Ayana Presley por escucharnos y apoyarnos siempre. Gracias, muchas gracias a todos. Que Dios les bendiga. In conclusion, I want my message to come from the very bottom of my heart and with the sole purpose of improving so that our most vulnerable people who are already facing difficulties due to food insecurity do not have to suffer any kind of unpleasant situation when confronting the system asking for some kind of help. Thank you to the City of Boston, the YMCA, C-Plan, Ruth Wong, State Representative Adrián Madaro, Council Julia Mejia, Senator Lydia Edwards, the Collaborative of Chelsea, Noah, um, sorry, and for all of their support that they provided in response for the request of food donation support during the most difficult days of the pandemic. And through the Faro, through the Faro de Luz Church, we were distributing food for our people in the community. Thank you for the Congress, Ayanna Presley, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, for listening to us and always supporting us. Thank you very much, and may God bless you all. Okay, so I do have some, some questions, but we'll hear from the rest of the panel before I get into them, okay? All right, thank you, Elsa. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Leah Artiaga, and um, in 2018, I started a really small food program, rescuing food from one store and feeding 20 families. It, it was just something that, uh, an opportunity that presented itself. Fast forward one year, it became multiple stores. It became members of the Ronald Bloomingdale community. Uh, it was amazing to, with the support that we got, and the Ronald Bloomingdale Food Collective was born, and then the pandemic came. And um, I can tell you my why. Um, I became a single mom in 2009 of a 5 and 8 and an 11-year-old. And my boss retired after 18 years. So I was on unemployment for the first time in my life and a single mom of three kids. And to experience food insecurity for the very first time, it was a, 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 a just like a shock. And I remember going to food pantries and I remember you can only go once a month. And it, it's five weeks in a month and you forget. They turn you away. And, that, and it's humiliating enough to have to go to the food pantry. But then to go to the food pantry and realize you missed it by three days because it's still in that month. That is my why. That's the reason why I, every single week I have a group of amazing volunteers that come together. We process 2,000 pounds of food. We don't make this food in less than an hour. My, my brother, Rick, runs a program in Hyde Park. These guys buy that food. We don't have the money to buy the food to give good quality food to the people in need. And one of the things that sets uh, us apart and a, a great need is that most food pantries require identification. Who am I to require identification who am I to make you prove that you live in this town? So we allow people to come every week and without identification. I believe that comida es un derecho humano básico, that food is a basic human right that everyone should have access to. And so we are a part of NFAC, the Neighborhood Food Action Collaborative. All that is is a bunch of very concerned dedicated, altruistic neighbors who have decided that they want to do what they can to make an impact on their own community. Because who knows the needs of the community more than the members of the community? Right? And so for us, we dedicate our time to meeting the needs and trying to get good, quality, healthy, culturally appropriate food to the people in need who don't have access to pay 
pandemic money, who don't have access to an identification so they can go to one of the four pantries in the city. We need, we need people who are non-documented to have SNAP access. We need more funds to go to local groups like NFAC to support people in our own community. was and still remains one of the town's hardest hit by the uh, COVID-19, which was also responsible for loss of unemployment and un unexplainable illnesses caused by virus. There are not a lot of healthy food programs in High Park where a person in need can really go to get uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. Some people have to go to other towns to then realize that they would need to live in that town in order to get food and have to show ID and proof of address. It's one thing to be food insecure, and it's even worse to lose your dignity while in the process. In fact, the Neighborhood Food Action Coalition, a little over a year, started to have some community meetings with leaders from Hyde Park and Rosenville in order to come up with some ideas on how we can help fight food insecurity in our communities. After a few meetings, we decided to start a Hyde Park food pop-up and committed to giving fresh produce to our community with dignity. When we started out a little over a year ago, we served over 50 people every Friday. And we really didn't expect to be there that long, you know, as a pop-up. It's temporary, right? So, um, and we kind of knew the government was going to step in to kind of alleviate the hardships that we were suffering, trying to figure out how we can maintain, and not just any food, but fresh, healthy, uh, affordable, you know, food and vegetables from uh, low-income families to get food. After all, it should not be a privilege to be able to be healthy. I think it should be a human right. Over a year later, we are providing three times the amount of food bags to approximately 150 families. I'm excited and elated um, our officials are going to do something to make sure low-income and unemployed families can eat healthy food. The cost of living is at an outstanding high right now and makes it seem impossible to buy fresh food on a budget. So I ask Congress to uh, ease the qualifications that you would need to become, to get benefits like uh, WIC and SNAP, for instance, and uh, fund or create access to food, uh, to healthy food, uh, to small programs like ours who are committed to continuing service serving our communities with dignity. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
because if you go to apply for a SNAP, it's not it's not fun. It's not because oh, I never got some money from the government. No, you truly need you struggling in your house. And I also believe that organizations such Project Red, CAS, Homeless Coalition, Soup uh, Project, they need more federal and state money so they can support their own community. I believe I went way over two minutes. Hi, this is Hector Romero. Um, he's worked in Boston for over 20 years now. Yeah, voy a contar sobre mi experiencia en, en la pandemia. En la pandemia, todos la pasamos muy mal, ¿no? Eh, voy a hablar por mí. En la pandemia no tenía como a ver comida para comer. Eh, Cómo pagar mis bills, es cierto que tengo mi propia casa, pero a veces personas tienen que porque uno tiene su propia casa tiene todo el dinero para para todo, para comida, ropa, pero la verdad que no es así porque a veces. Sorry, um, so he is just going to describe his experiences during the COVID-19. Um, so. During COVID-19, he struggled a lot with food insecurity. Um, and although he currently owns his own house, um, people think that when you own your own house here in the United States, that you have whatever, it, you have the funds for whatever expenses come with that. Um, and unfortunately, during COVID-19, um, he struggled with food insecurity. And, um, and um, los, los, um las personas que yo rento en, en mi edificio la estaban pasando igual que yo también eh, no tenían para comer eh, para pagar sus biles se las que estaban con su renta también pero yo entendía no entonces pero después en mis Boston vi que Easty Farm eh, ayudaba a las personas daba comida ayudaba con mi hijo. So similar to him, his tenants were struggling through food insecurity as well. Um, they didn't have money for bills either. They were late, they were late on their rent, and because he was going through the same thing, he understood their struggles and didn't um, ask for much of them. Um, during the pandemic, he did notice that the Eastie Farm was willing to uh, help those that suffered through food insecurity. Yeah, me ayudaron mucho con comida. Um, programas, programas de educación um, hice más amigos conocí más personas en la comunidad yo pienso que en Boston necesita más organizaciones como Easty Fan para conocernos todos ¿no? y hablar de las necesidades que vivimos not only was Easty Farm able to provide him with food but they were also able to educate him through the process he was also able to make friends um, within Eastie Farm as well. He believes that communities like East Boston should have more programs like Eastie Farm, not only not, not only to help through food insecurity, but to be able to have a way to make friends, to be able to educate others. Y, y, um, y ayudar a las personas que coman más saludable. Um, Para mí significa todo, que hay más organizaciones en Boston para escuchar las necesidades de, la, de, la, de todos, porque a veces los que, los que no tenemos documentos acá tenemos con miedo a hablar, porque ya todos lo saben, ¿no? 
Um, he believes that this program is core to the community and um, He wants more organizations. He wants to see more organizations like Easty Farm throughout the city of Boston, so that they can listen to the community um, being engaged. Because um, a lot of undocumented people um, fear speaking up for obvious reasons, and he wants to eliminate that fear within people through programs like East Boston, Easty Farm. Yeah. Eh, eso es todo. Y gracias. Buenos días a todos los presentes aquí en este lugar. Mi nombre es Jeremías Rosa. Y vivo por más de 20 años aquí en la ciudad de East Boston. Eh, Hi, this is Jeremias, and he has lived over 20 years in the city of East Boston. Es un privilegio poder dirigirme a ustedes y poder compartir parte de mi vida y de la familia de la iglesia Apóstol y Profetas aquí en East Boston. It is a privilege to speak here to all of you and speak on behalf of to speak on behalf of this church, apostles and prophets. Nosotros somos padres y madres salvadoreños. Estamos felices de poder venir a los Estados Unidos, que es un lugar de abundancia, pero aquí. Han habido veces que he llorado. I come here and speak to you as a father, as well as the other mothers um, who are in our church. And it is a privilege to come to the United States, to a country with abundance. But even in this country of abundance, there have been times where I have cried. Los documentos ha sido una de las cosas requeridas para trabajar. Yo perdón a las autoridades ya que nos ha tocado mentir. For a lot of jobs they ask you for documents of which you sometimes have to lie on. Recordemos que no hay justo que por justo no peque. Abraham mintió cuando entró a Egipto, ya que el hambre era grande. He said, I apologize to the authorities because we've had to lie. Let's remember that there is no justice because there is justice. Abraham lied when he entered when he entered into Egypt because his hunger was large. Pero el humano siempre hace lo que es necesario para sobrevivir. En la Biblia, Isaac, al buscar ayuda para su pobreza, mintió a Abimelech. En la Biblia, Isaac buscó ayuda en su pobreza y mintió a Abimelech. A, nos, a nosotros nos ha tocado igual para poder pagar la vivienda y utilidades. 
and we have had to suffer the same in order to be able to pay for our living and utilities. La comida, gracias a organizaciones como Instifarm y otras que se han ocupado en dar esa ayuda. Thanks to organizations like Easty Farm and others that have made it possible for that have made it possible to be able to accomplish homes and to have made it possible to accomplish food and homes of the poor. And I thank them for their authority and the government um, for always supporting us. Necesitamos organizaciones que nos una con ayuda para nuestra comunidad, para que siempre estemos unidos. Vivimos en isla separada, culpa de los sistemas que nos deciden. We need organizations that help us to help us unite in our community. We live in islands that are separate due to the systems that decide in what islands we're on. Eso tiene que cambiar y le pedimos la ayuda a nuestro gobierno que nos ayude. Lo segundo, nuestro idioma, que no es el oficial de los Estados Unidos y en lugares de trabajo nos han humillado por hablar nuestro idioma con algunos compañeros. These things need to change, and I ask for help from our government. The second, secondary is our language. That is not the official language of the United States. And in, play, in our workplaces, we are often humiliated for speaking in our language to our coworkers. Pero gracias a personas como, como ustedes, que, se han, que han podido comprendernos nuestra situación y nos han ayudado para poder salir de situaciones como esta. But thank you for people like yourselves and organizations that have been able to comprehend and understand our situation and help improve us. Dios le bendiga. But certainly not least, I feel just, uh, I am not prepared. <laughs> um, just say what's on your heart, because you lead with your heart in community every day. I do. So just your name and uh, where you live and the organization you're affiliated with, and then whatever you'd like to share with us and into two minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Presley, for giving me the opportunity to share a few words. Um, I'm in the middle of running our East Boston Community Soup Kitchen. I am the founder and executive director of this little nonprofit organization that was founded six, six years ago. Um, I love you on your name for the record. Is that I am, I am Sandra Lorena Aleman Nija. I know it's a long name, so shortcut Sandra Nija. We want to make sure the White House gets it right, so every <laughs> single part of that name. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Um, you know, we have been addressing food insecurity for the past six years. When I came up with this idea and reached out to neighbors, friends in our community, uh, we didn't have organizations really addressing food insecurity the way it is happening now, especially with you know, the pandemic coming around. Um, and we were at the place where people were coming from all walks of life. 
you know, like some of our friends here that described and shared some of their stories about, you know, having a place to live, but they're facing food insecurity. Um, you know, they're un undocumented. They can't qualify for SNAP or those that do, you know, it's very limited. So they barely make ends meet. So they come to soup kitchens like mine to get some help. You know, they take with them a bag of groceries so that they can feed their children. And so the soup kitchen before the pandemic, we were already giving out groceries. We were receiving a lot of donations from Shaw's, um, Chano Fish, um, Easty Farm has been also a partner of ours. Um, we've been collaborating from the very beginning. Um, and like them, also other organizations, sister organizations in our community, small businesses, um, local organizations, you know, so it's been a collaboration of so many members in our community that have come to our rescue to help us, especially during the pandemic. When COVID came, we had just become a nonprofit, a 501c3. I wanna say maybe like two months before the pandemic, we had become an official, officially a nonprofit. That saved our lives because, because of that, the government was able to include us in some of the you know, funding that they were giving out to organizations that were assisting neighbors and addressing food insecurity during this emergency. Um, our homeless, of course, is, they are our main focus, you know, but we don't turn anybody away. Everyone that comes to our doors, we give them whatever we have. But again, our focus is, you know, helping our homeless, our addicts, people who are completely invisible and marginalized by society. And we try to connect them to local resources, you know, to help them get out of the streets and have a second chance at life. So, um, you know, but right now, we, we are helping more than 600 families. Uh, the line on Tuesdays gets super long. Uh, we have a lot of families with children waiting in line in the sun, you know, and now the uh, library, the East Boston Library, Mari uh, and Deborah, um, our state reps, uh, Andrea Madaro's mother, they bring books, you know, and we give those uh, children's books to our children while they're waiting in line. Um, and so, and then we also give out the uh, hot meal vouchers to our homeless, and now we don't, we don't take care of everybody at the same time on Tuesdays. We have Mondays that are focused specifically to help our homeless. So we do an intake and we find out what the needs are. And if we don't have the items they need, then we make sure we have them for them the following week. Um, but we are in great need for more help. We tend to be overlooked by those in power, in government and all. You know, our soup kitchen, our, tends to fall in those little like forgotten kind of corners. And it's been really tough for us to get the resources we need. Um, and I do wanna recognize that we do have, you know, some people that have really been there for us, but we tend to be always like the last. Um, so I'm just asking for, you know, please keep us in your radar. Um, please don't forget about us. We are in need of a building so that we can be open every day, so we can feed our people every day, not just once a week or twice a week, um, and so that we can help our people get better. We do have several of our homeless that have turned their lives around, so, you know, because we help them. So we want to continue to make that difference in their lives. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Alexandra, okay. Um, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Alexandra. You know, here we're talking about uh, food access, but you know, all the work that we do ultimately, this is something that uh, Council Rodriguez speaks to often, begins with information justice, the language justice. So the role that you're playing here today is so critical. You know, I'm a believer that no one is voiceless, but too many are unheard. Uh, and so we would not be able to hear every voice assembled here today if you were not providing this critical service. So I just want to thank you. Um, I also 
just want to say that um, I look forward to a day where people do not have to relive their trauma in order to compel action. But I am grateful for your willingness to do so, especially uh, when it is clear around issues of hunger in particular. Again, there is great stigmatization, stereotyping, and shame. And as so many of you spoke to for our neighbors and loved ones living in the shadows and on the margins, those that are undocumented, on top of the stereotyping, the stigmatization, and shame, there is real fear. And so, uh, again, I thank you for sharing your stories and your experiences and, and lifting all of those points. Um, I will say, although I'm grateful for your translation, that even when our witness, or those who came to testify, were speaking only in Spanish, that I understood a lot of what they were saying. Not because I said Spanish, I said Latin. <laughs> Um, but because they were speaking from a place of pain and trauma and struggle. And hardship is universal. And when you have lived that, you understand whatever language people are speaking in. But I wanted to make that point that hardship and struggle are universal because it breaks my heart and so many of you have gotten the message that struggle is a moral failing or a character flaw. And the reason so many are struggling is because, as I said, hunger is a policy choice and a violent one. This is a humanitarian crisis. This is a policy failing. It is a moral failing of those of us in, in power which is why what you've offered today is so important because more often than not, and I see my good colleague here, Counselor Arroyo, government responds. It does not often lead. And so in this moment, you are going to ensure that the government, that the White House responds to you and the needs of our community and every member in it because no one should know the pain of hunger. I have um, just several quick questions, and I won't direct them to anyone in particular, um, just whoever would like to, to respond. I just ask that every time you, uh, you respond to the question, that you will say your name, and if your affiliation, and where you live. We just need that for the record, because again, we're giving this to the White House word for word. Um, many of you spoke about the power and the need of community-based organizations given their accessibility um, in you know, proximity, sort of geography, language access, trusted voices. My first question is, how did you find out about these organizations? Or maybe, yes, of course. Ella pregunta que ustedes cómo se dieron cuenta de esas organizaciones como me imagino VC Farm, and um, by looking for food. Okay. All right. I'm trying to uh, get to if there's a, an access issue. So where there are resources available, do the people in need even know they are available? So when you are connected, how are you connected? Is it word of mouth? Was it in the newspaper? Was it a radio ad? How are you finding out? Stand from you, here. Um, local organizations, we partner with creating a flyer and we put on there our names and dates and times that we're providing the services. And so that's been a collaboration, again, by a few of us, um, including Easty Farm, the uh, Neighborhood Health Center, the East Boston Community Soup Kitchen, and other organizations, and also your church, uh, ELSA. So it's been several, and then what I've been doing is 
putting those flyers in the bags and giving them to people that come to the soup kitchen in the same way I'm assuming the other organizations do too. Okay. So it's a each other. sort of mutual aid and organic. Yes, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. And and then my question is, individually or as organizations, can you speak to during the pandemic what federal aid or um, what direct aid or resources was most helpful to you? So I think a lot of times we just speak to the problem, but we need to know what is working so that we can preserve those things and also increase their capacity. So when it comes to direct individual aid or resources for a uh, provider organization, what, what did you access and what was helpful? Um, hello again. Uh, my name is Denise Lawlers. Uh, I'm a resident of Somerville and also I'm a CAS board member. Um, so for me, the SNAP is something, the old food stamp, something that I believe most of people in America know about this resource. They just don't know how much they're going to get and how it is. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, when I knew I didn't have any more money to pay my rent and my utility bills, um, I contacted the city of Somerville. And because there was a lot of people struggling, contact us. So I did, and they said, we have no funding anymore. That was August of 2020. And that's when they say, please contact CAS, which I did. And in the meantime, like, I contacted CAS, I applied for RAFT, I, I consider myself um, a resourceful person. I do go online, I try to find as much as I can. However, mass.gov, I feel like it is good, but it's not very clear. There are a lot of great areas on the okay. site that it doesn't really fully explain the process. And it's brutal, the process when you apply for funds. So that's when I was put in touch with CAS. And in the meantime, my landlord sent me a notice to quit. And very quick, I became a CAS client. They didn't have, they helped me a little bit, but they didn't have enough funds. And in the meantime, I contacted capital charities. Uh, I had my therapist contact me, the whole Beth Israel Dickens Medical Center to help me which they did with a month, and RAP took about 168 days for me to hear back from them. But uh, as it has been, um, besides like getting information to the city of Somerville, also online, I got a lot of information. But it's not easy. Okay. And you have um, two children. Yes. And I think you said initially uh, your food, uh, the money that, uh, that you had, was a, a budget of eighty dollars a month? A month. Okay. And now that is how much? Well, then went to before like on August of twenty twenty, it went to one hundred and fifty one dollars. Now that is a little the snap has a little bit more the benefits raise a little bit, but it shows to do the pandemic response. I am receiving a total, because it's two amount, so I'm receiving a total of $323 a month. $323 a month. For a family of three. But I in in, in in Somerville. In Somerville. And you were self-employed, so you're, you've been really impacted. Yes, and okay. child support counts as um, income in cases like that, so it's good. Okay, thank you. That is an important point. And I wonder also, as a, as a parent, if you would um, speak to me. You have three children, correct? I have three. But my name is Lee Archiaga. I'm in Rodwindale. And um, I work with Health Leads and NFAC. And I have three grown boys now. Uh, they are 18, 21, and 24. But when you were uh, in the midst of, um, when you have these disruptive life events happen, uh, which impacted your ability to you know, provide food for your children. I just want people to understand kind of the, the choices that folks are forced to make, what that feels like. I don't think they understand like what is that impact day to day. Well, I mean, one of the biggest impacts is you have to make a choice. Are you gonna pay your electric bill or are you gonna buy food? Are you gonna pay your gas bill or are you gonna buy food? So what you do is you 
buy food, you postpone the electric bill, and then you pay the gas bill. But then the next month, you you know, you basically you rob Paul to pay Mary. Yeah. You, you constantly have to juggle that. And I think that uh, for our organization, we got support through the Office of Food Justice. They gave a grant to our two programs. That's the only way we survived, mm -hmm. being able to buy food to give back to the community. And those grants are so critical because, again, the, the small ones, we're little, right? We're, we're easily overlooked. Right. We, we make a, trauma, a dramatic impact in our small comu community, but we get very little resources. Over, Overutilized, under-resourced. Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, one, one more question. Um, from a health perspective, um, could you just speak to the issue of whether or not the food has uh, cultural competency, is palatable? Because I think that there are situations where food is being provided, and because it isn't culturally palatable, even though we're, we're providing it, people are not eating it. And so they're still uh, going hungry. So if anyone wants to speak to um, access to fresh and healthy food, and, and also uh, food that is culturally relevant. Let's hear from Ricardo first, and then we'll go to you, Sandra. So, um, with Say your name, please. Ricardo Henry, uh, Hyde Park, and Impact, um, and with Food Access. Uh, so, I remember when the um, pandemic first hit, and you know, I wasn't working, just my wife, kids were in school from home. And um, what I used to do is I used to get in my car every day, and I'll drive around the neighborhood and other neighborhoods and look to Try to find places that are giving food out so I can come home and feed the family. Or I, I like to cook myself, but I, I don't like to cook very much. But um, I, you know, I, I found a few places where I can get out of out of my community where I can get uh, fresh food to eat. Um, to the question of um, cultural food, um, where we do our cook, um, where we do our program every week in uh, River Street, 705 River Street. The community is comprised mainly of, um, I say Haitian, Haitian Creole, and um, so we have to buy food that's appropriately cultural for them. And I find that kind of food is very really expensive, like plantains and you know, the potatoes and the stuff that, you know, seasonings and stuff like that. Um, it was cheaper in the pandemic than it is now. So you'd be reached out to, we got a grant from the Office of Food Justice, and we reached out to different uh, small businesses in the community, the stop and shops and stuff, asking for money. After all, it takes a village, right? So we, we, we got all our resources together, and we have to buy most of our food, because in these days, especially when people are donating food to you, it's not the freshest. And we strongly believe in giving our people in our community so, so one more question on that, and I want to move to Sandra. Did you have something else you wanted to add? Oh, wait, one second. Um, and I know we have to wrap on, on this on this panel because I could learn from you all all day, honestly. Um, is it your opinion or your experience that it would be better to be provided with uh, financial resourcing where you would have the flexibility? to more customize and curate what you are providing a family or a community, or giving them the agency to be able to determine for themselves with a, um, a stop and shop gift card or something like that. So, uh, Sandra, do you want to speak to that? Yes, please. Um, Sandra, here. Um, yes, the uh, food justice grants that we received from federal at uh, the beginning of the pandemic helped us so much because with that we bought gift cards. They were not really that much, but you know, $25. Um, and then we um, did an intake, just a quick survey, just to find out how many family members or how many people were in a family and a household. And then we will give them, you know, 75 the most for a family of 10 or 12 members, especially with small children. Um, and that was super appreciated because that gave them the freedom to buy the food items they use. Because when we were receiving the food boxes, there was a lot of waste. There were so many food items that were not at all um, 
uh, taken, that were left behind uh, because uh, they were not culturally appropriate. You know, uh, we, we take care of so many Muslim, Arabic families, Chinese, Latinos, Caucasians, um, and also um, Portuguese, uh, Brazilians. So everybody, we all have different ways of eating, you know, as you know. So uh, it was, it's been really sad to see so much food waste, even though we try to rescue it as much as we can, but it's the same people we're serving, and so they don't need it. They, that's not the kind of food they eat. Like, for example, canned foods. So much canned food. We're not used to eating canned food. We like to prepare our own foods. And like you said, you know, fresh food, and you like to cook your own food. Yeah. So we try to buy, you know, the oil, the kitchen staples, and then, you know, getting the halal meats, you know, for our Muslim families. We want to make sure that we take care of everybody. So flexibility. 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 Self-agency. Yes. Ultimately, this all comes back to dignity. Yes. yes. Which is, seems to be, that's a reoccurring experience that people are being denied. Yes. Either when seeking services or just... Uh, in the isolation of the experience and just being hungry at all. And so this is does restore some of that. Yes. You can choose that which is familiar and healthy. And we, the soup kitchen, we were providing halal meats once a week and we had to alternate, you know, with the, like the beef and the lamb is super expensive. The chicken is like the least expensive. The so chicken is like $4, $5, a pound, and we get this food all the way from Vermont, okay? And they bring it to us on Tuesdays early morning. Sometimes there are pickups on the, you know, on the road, so our people have to wait in line for much longer. Anyway, um, now we cut it back. We're giving them meat only once a month because we don't have the funds to buy the halal meat. Okay, Stephen, thank you so much. Okay. Um, and I, I want to turn it over uh, to Elsa, but I know we have to close this, this panel out, and I'm going to uh, continue to frustrate my staff with one more question out there, which is just, um, if anyone wants to speak to the impact or the difference made by farmers markets um, and, uh, any, and the schools, because these are things that we've been working on federally to expand access, flexibility, uh, with EBT and SNAP when it comes to farmers markets, so is that impactful? And also looking to improve the quality of school food an issue that I've been working on since I was on the council, so that it is not prepackaged, um, but it is fresh. So just trying to get a full picture, okay? But let's uh, hear from Elsa. Whatever's on your mind, I just want to give uh, Elsa a final word for something else you'd like to share. Okay. Uh, yo pienso que es importante que provean ayuda financiera a organizaciones locales acá en mis postos especialmente para que puedan distribuir ayudas especialmente para personas más vulnerables sin estatus migratorios que no tienen ningún acceso a cualquier programa federal o estatal. She believes it's important that these um, small community organizations provide the funding necessary in order to be able to provide the adequate foods and resources that is needed um, to people, especially in East Boston, that are undocumented, that aren't able to access these sort of programs, these federal funding programs, because of their legal status. Y también con respecto a la primera pregunta que hizo, nosotros en East Boston estamos muy organizados, hay grupos en WhatsApp, hay redes sociales, de las cuales nosotros nos enteramos de las ayudas de las organizaciones que están acá en East Boston, por ejemplo, pero necesitamos más fondos, más dinero para que puedan tener uh, suficientes recursos para proveer a nuestra comunidad. A community like East Boston is very well organized. Um, they have smaller communities and then they use um, social media like WhatsApp, Facebook groups and Messenger in order to be able to, and this is in respect to the first question that you asked, and able to be, in order to be able to um, make these programs more accessible to the community and let those that don't even know of them um, aware of them. However, what they lack is funding. They need funding in order to be able to provide these resources because without the funding, they're unable to achieve any of that. Y para finalizar, 
me gustaría y es un deseo muy grande de mi corazón que el gobierno federal creara un programa especial para todas aquellas familias que no califican para tener el programa de estampillas de comida para que también pudieran tener acceso a ese recurso tan importante y que ayuda tanto a nuestra familia. See, she said uh, one, one more thing, right? And that's because we're probably related, or, or maybe, maybe you're trying to be an elected official. Okay, but either way, okay, let's hear it. Her last um, thing was that she wishes, and again, this is just her wish, that um, there is an organization or funding um, for those that are undocumented or those that are unable to um, qualify for these food stamps or for these SNAP programs, which seems like they have strong or stricter guidelines in order to qualify for them. Um, so she just wishes that there was a different program in order to actually be able to provide resources for our families. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to have to close out the panel, so I will have to circle back with all of you on the, that last question I had. But I just want to, this was a very powerful panel. Uh, in my opinion, it's the most important uh, panel today. No disrespect to anyone. Um, but um, thank you for your willingness to share your stories. Uh, it was uh, as powerful as it was painful, but, but necessary. Thank you so much. We'll start from um, your left uh, to right, okay? Um, and again, if people would just state uh, your name, uh, the, the city, or rather the city or neighborhood uh, that you live in, and uh, what, if any, affiliation you might like to, to share, uh, and then if you'll offer um, your testimony. And then just given the interest of time and, and how many esteemed uh, providers we have here today, uh, we're looking at about uh, 35 minutes for this panel. So instead of asking the question at the end, I'm going to ask you to be thoughtful about this as you're giving your testimony, which is what are ways that government at all levels, from city council to the governor to Congress to the White House, can advance your organization's mission to end hunger? And are there any emerging trends or patterns that you're seeing related to hunger in community? Say the first question again. What are ways the government at all levels, 
can advance your organization's mission to end hunger? And are there any emerging or broad trends or patterns that you've noticed related to hunger in community? So if you'd like to speak to that in your testimony, uh, that would uh, allow us to move more efficiently. Okay, Rita, we'll begin with you. Thank you. Make sure you're speaking into the mic because we have to record and synthesize all of this for the White House. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share um, our experiences here. Um, uh, so my name is Rita Lara, and I'm with the Office of Community Services. Um, we pivoted in sort of four ways into food at the beginning of the pandemic because we're based in uh, a mixed income um, housing development that was already dealing with lots of food. Food security had a monthly food program, but we had to turbocharge <laughs> our monthly food program when the pandemic happened. Um, and you know, we're in the housing development, about a thousand people live there, so we started distributing food and uh, you know mostly through whatever was available which was uh, at the time sort of some of the community lunches but we we couldn't really access food from the traditional system so we couldn't access food at the time I, I testified with the um, you, you know with the local city council about this we couldn't really access and, and I think we weren't alone a lot of people couldn't really access food because the need was so great that organizations really needed to be nimble uh, and you know, and have enough food to have the infrastructure set up, and I think that's a very hard thing to do. Um, so we we're still distributing food. We distributed um, um, about eighty-three thousand uh, grocery bags to date, about seven hundred thousand uh, pounds of food to date. Still distributing on the same day that we did when we really began on Wednesdays at two o'clock at Maverick Landing. Um, and I, I want to share that, uh, that that early work, and even the work now, was, was not done at all. It was very much a strong grassroots response. It involved the mutual aid. Um, and as actually um, um, Elsa testified, the sort of system, that's where the, the real large system of WhatsApp, you know, you know kind of communication really started. And, you know, uh, you know I'm part of uh, over a dozen WhatsApp groups with this page. But they're so valuable for really staying connected. So that's really important infrastructure. Um, um, I also want to say that uh, it's amazing to me that it's been 50 years since this kind of last um, you know, conference, White House conference. The last one was in 1969. That's a long time. <laughs> and food insecurity has been here. I think that's a testament to the fact that often the voices uh, from the ground, the voices most affected, don't don't get heard. Um, we, we should have been doing something about this sooner, pre-pandemic. So I really appreciated what Sandra from the soup kitchen, you know, where she talked about, hey, we were here doing this work before. Um, and we were doing it the best that we can. Um, and, and I think, I'm, I'm excited though, because I know this, this, um, this is a big opportunity. Out of the last conference, we, you know, we got the supplemental nutrition program, we got the nutritional school lunch program, we got the school breakfast program. So big legislation came out of that last conference in 1969. Um, and while those programs need some big changes, um, I think it's really um, an exciting time for maybe coming up with some <coughs> innovation, some changes to some of those core programs. Um, I do, I, I saw someone sort of point out <laughs> that I think, I don't know if that means on that time or have done. No, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. So I do have some, some recommendations. I think we should expand services to SNAP by expanding the cap so that it increases according to the inflation and market actuals um, over the last two years and moving forward. Um, I think we should expand dollars to WIC to ensure proper nutrition to children. This will especially be necessary for states who have and are criminalizing abortion. I think we should increase the quality of food available to the Summer East program and to the school lunch program to make sure it's wholesome, nutritious, and that children want to eat it. And I think we should make it easier to do, redistribute that food to others who are experiencing food insecurity who may want to eat it, you know, such as our elderly. Um, I think we should make systems less time consuming for neighborhood-based anti-poverty organizations who are frontline responders and facilitating access to families. Uh, locating uh, and resourcing those services in community basis and should be priori prioritized. Um, I think we should research and prioritize increasing, increasing access within re relational versus bureaucratic and business systems. And that's really important because bureaucratic and business systems 
operate a very traditional service delivery model where one is simply seen as a consumer versus a person I know and love. And so that's really important because that shape, that's, that's all about dignity, right? So creating dignity in, your, in the way you deliver services. Um, and I think we should triangulate COVID, chronic illness, and life longevity data to prioritize location of services with consensus tracks where the most affected populations live. I think that's going to be increasingly important because people getting COVID one, two, three, four times are going to become very sick. And that's something we're seeing now, and that's something we're going to see more of. So again, we need to consider, is it a relational-based system, or is it a bureaucratic <coughs> stamp next? We, we, we can't do that anymore to people. <laughs> we shouldn't have done it ever. Um, and I think there are places where the most affected people, I mean, the most affected people, in terms of both food and housing security, are very well represented, racially, ethnically, socially, economically, and they have strong relationships built on trust. Um, and I think it's really important that we prioritize, again, locating and resourcing services within those systems. I don't think that happens now. I think we're prioritizing resourcing within very traditional service delivery systems that don't consider dignity, that don't consider these other aspects. And I think we do that because it's easier. They're somehow easier to reach, or it seems it's just easier to do, and so we do that. But I think we have to do things more thoughtfully rather than easier. Um, and I do think, as a last final note, I just want to say that, that spaces where people are likely well presented um, include mutual aid, mutual aid systems, subsidized public and mixed income housing developments, neighborhoods where soup kitchens are based, where English as a second language programs are based, as well as faith-based institutions. Those institutions aren't readily prioritized for, res you know, for resources or for locating services. If we want to deal with access, then we're going to have to dig in deep and reach the right places and the right people. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Well said. Well said. Thank you, Rita. Hi. My name is Kathy Field, and I'm the Director of Health Promotion and Service Programs at the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. I'm joined here today with Ms. Vermont, our President and CEO. As you are aware, the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center is a federally qualified health center with our emphasis on comprehensive primary and preventive services that promote reductions in health disparities um, regardless of people's ability to pay. We serve over 90,000 registered, registered patients with over with just under 500,000 patient visits. Historically, our service area was and continues to be home to a large immigrant community with an ongoing influx of recently arrived residents facing additional challenges of language and cultural barrier, barriers and ineligibility to social services due to immigration status. Living in fear of being reported as undocumented, area residents are forced to make choices how to allocate limited resources each and every day, often negatively impacting health outcomes. The East Boston Neighborhood Health Center has a long and robust track record of screening and food insecurity among its patients and using this information to connect them to vital food resources. EBMHC is actively engaged in food access on multiple fronts. Our staff, staff connect patients to SNAP, where PIP, and various EBMHC programs to create additional localized food access points. We strive to match patients to food resources to meet their individual needs. We deliver 110,000 meals to seniors, manage the East Boston Farmers Market, offer a year-round subsidized CSA program, sponsor a wellness garden, and partner with the Red Cross to operate food pantry, which serves over 500 families each month. We know food is medicine. Diets that are rich in nutritious food, along with physical activity, are key components to any treatment plan for chronic disease, such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and depression. In 2020, EBMHC joined Mass Health Flex Flexible Services Program that Project Bread will describe in more detail. Since its launch, over 70, 700 of our patients with complex chronic conditions have received services. In addition to referrals to SNAP and other resources, patients receive gift cards, kitchen supplies, and nutrition counseling. This program has not only reduced food insecurity among our patients, but it also, also increased their engagement with our staff and improved their health outcomes. We have also learned some key lessons. 
Health care is a critical access point for households that are food insecure. Patients trust their providers at health centers and are willing to disclose that they are facing financial hardship in accessing, accessing and affording food. We've learned someone, <clears throat> we, when we learn someone is food insecure, we recognize that we need to provide them just more than a bag of groceries. We need to get them signed up for SNAP, as we do with many, but we also know that SNAP isn't enough and also isn't available to all. We need to ensure that they have enough resource to per purchase healthy food of their choice and that is culturally appropriate. A program like Mass Health Flexible Services provides support for this. We also need to ensure that folks can store and prepare food at their home. With over 700 patients who participate in the program, 693 were also given supplies. And of course, we must build community trust. Providing individualized, culturally appropriate services which reflect the communities that we serve, both here at EBMHC and when we refer um, patients to partners. We hope to be able to see programs like this expand, as we know that there are many patients at our, at our health center and across the state that would benefit from nutrition needs are met. I would like to echo, not gonna say that. <laughs> okay, change the order of the, um, okay. <laughs> okay. of the um, presentation. Okay. And, and, and I'd also like to add that um, you know, very much related to everything that was said at on the first um, panel, as far as those with lived experiences and, and their and their struggles being able to prioritize um, how, how their resources are divided. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you to uh, the president and CEO um, Ms. Warlock for joining us as well. And I just very appreciate the role that you play each and every day. Thank you. Every pandemic, and especially during the incredible model for the Commonwealth and in the country. My name is Catherine Lynn. I am the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs for the Great Boston Food Bank. Um, I'm representing the Great Boston Food Bank today, which is the food bank that's feeding Eastern Massachusetts. Um, we provide free, healthy food to nearly about 600 feeding partners, such as pantries, meal programs, shelters, and mobile markets at health centers, schools, colleges, and senior centers in 190 very diverse, multicultural cities and towns of varying needs. Many of those partners uh, from your district are actually here today and have already even spoken and will speak. Uh, we more than doubled our operations during the pandemic. Uh, with the same amount of staff, more or less the same infrastructure, um, we provided about 100 million meals through those partners on the ground <coughs> this past year. Um, the mo majority of that is through direct food um, but also through grocery cars, which was new during the pandemic. Um, SNAP outreach, which we've done for a number of years and enabled uh, food, uh, which is a program that we um, partner grocery stores with local, par with local partners in their communities um, to donate food that will otherwise look like food. Um, our recent, we just released a statewide study uh, that showed one, as many as one in three people found themselves as food insecure just last year. Um, one in three. And since last year, inflation has risen to the highest in 40 years, as many of us know. Everyone is feeling this pinch of food, gas, astronomical high cost of living. But those who have already been struggling with food insecurity or were on the brink are feeling it even harder right now. And there's no real end in sight. We're facing a potential hunger uh, cliff in, in the fall, as you know, with the potential end of the national public health emergency, and are already starting to feel it with critical programs like the child tax credit and national university school meals um, no longer available. Stimulus funding and increased resources are running thin compared to the height of the pandemic, and in hunger is as worse as, it, as it's ever been. Um, our partners are feeling uh, this uh, as well. Um, they're struggling, they're tired, their resources to operate are limited and unstable, and they are serving more people than ever, as I just mentioned. As noted by my colleagues, they're serving the role of, of many, um, many needs, and they're also you know, those trusted members of the community, some who are serving double, triple, more than they were just even a couple months ago. We just held two listening sessions with our network in the last week um, for our own comments that we're going to submit to the, the White House. 
And this was the resounding thing that we heard um, on those calls. So we've been hearing for the last couple of years, but um, people are really tired, and and, and uh, this this we worry about how sustainable this is. Um, we need to make sure these partners in the community are prioritized. They're given, you know, basic things, health permits, um, zoning. Um, they're getting access to municipal funds. They're considered essential workers, along with, you know, our doctors and nurses. There are, are tens of thousands of workers across Massachusetts uh, working um, and volunteering within a thousand of these partners um, on the ground, and, and they're struggling themselves. It's not uncommon that those workers, at those partners begin as, as patients themselves. The investment we've been making in uh, capacity grants from the Great Boston Food Bank alone um, is not enough to keep up with the demand. Our most valuable impact has been the consistent supply of free food. Um, so on average, our partners, those 600, par 600 partners, rely on about 80% of their food from the Great Boston Food Bank. Some are 100%. Um, we need to ensure that quality, the quality, quantity and quality of food continues and increases, increasing the bridge and bridging the gap between the federal and the state nutrition benefits. Um, you mentioned earlier, that, I love it, the under, overutilized, under-resourced, and that is exactly what we're talking about within our, our network right now. And so we need to ensure the maximum food resources um, or those net nutrition benefits are um, funded at the maximum benefit, and the, the flexibilities that we saw during the pandemic remain. Um, things like TFAP, there are basic things that some of our partners were never able to actually provide TFAP food, and because of those flexibilities, we increased access to that one uh, food source. Um, GBFB is a uh, benefit of, um, well, we're spending about $40 million on food ourselves per year, um, and that's only through fundraising, and donations are dropping, um, TFAP food is dropping as well, and we need to ensure that that's uh, adequately funded, not only for food, but also supply chain. You know, we, every single day we probably have three or four shipments that are delayed or missed or don't even show up. So that's the challenge we're facing, um, as well as labor shortages. Um, so locally, here in Massachusetts, we also benefit from a program that funds um, the state about $30 million to purchase uh, food for those partner agencies. We're providing, um, and we're purchasing from about 40 farms. Um, this is uh, an established partnership. We, in pandemic, we actually increased it and increased the partnership with the local seafood industry, and there's so much more we could do. And I think that this is a statewide program that could be a model, it could be replicated, it could be expanded. Um, to not only just Massachusetts, within Massachusetts, but also nationally. Um, programs like health, HIP, uh, the Healthy Incentives Programs, to maximize that SNAP benefit um, and make sure that there's increased access to those local farmers markets and the local um, nutritious food that's available. Um, that's a one-to-one -one match and it's very powerful and there's a lot of uh, stuff that we'll include in our written remarks. Um, there's a lot that's been done here in Massachusetts that's been able to maximize access, but it also needs to be communicated. So going back to that uh, communication, the resources going down to local municipalities and making sure that you know, those, uh, the information is connected. Um, every single community is very different, and they need to be localized. You know this, we don't treat any one agency or partner of ours uh, the same. Um, aside from our, our uh, policies, but we know that they know their community best, and that's how funding should be allocated as well. Um, I know I'm up on time, so I'm going to uh, quickly just wrap up. I just think uh, the other piece that I hope that this conference does address is workforce development and training, um, and just you know, addressing those underlying um, pathways to economic prosperity. Um, that is really the underpinning of this. Um, so yes, our, our, all of our nutrition benefits have to be maximized. Our resources can be connected, communicated, and, and some translation services is also the only to have opportunities. And thank you, and I uh, very much appreciate you having this Thank you again uh, for what you do every day, and for what you offer what here uh, today. It's
afternoon, Congresswoman Ayala Presley. My name is Maria Lisa Jesus. I'm filling in for big shoes today. Our executive director, Gladys Vega, was unfortunately not available. She had an emergency. Um, but I've worked with Gladys since I was 14. She hired me for the summer youth program, and now I'm the executive director of the, um, of the policy and organizing department at the Colaboratia. I'm also a district counselor in Chelsea. Um, so when we're you have your own big shoes in your <laughs> Thank you. So when we're talking about food insecurity, we truly need a transformative food security plan for families. Our food lines in La Colorativa see over 10,000 families a week. We have to take a holistic approach because if there's no food on the table, we know that they're struggling with birth, housing, and mental health. Food lines, door knocking, emergency response teams that are working around the clock, Saturdays and Sundays, that's what La Colorativa focuses on most because many of our families are homebound. They don't leave their home, whether it's the domestic violence they're dealing with, whether, whether it's depression, trauma, everything that COVID has you know, triggered and, and left behind, for whatever reason, they're home and these services are not getting to them. And so one of our biggest lifelines is our door knockers. I want to give a shout out to Natalia Despejo, who's here with me today. Not only does she lead our civic engagement department, but she's also out there knocking on doors, and she's also the face of BTA in Chelsea, Revere, and sometimes even families from East Boston. Instead of going to the BTA office, they come to La Colombia, and they get to sit down with Natalia. She's many times celebrating little victories with them or crying with them. I mean, she just, she, she knows how to take care of her families and a deeper connection um, and, and, and more care, respect, and dignity. The families we serve in Chelsea, East Boston, Everett, and Lynn, they're very vulnerable. They have language barriers, trauma, they're suffering financially due to the inflation or even just the aftereffect of COVID. So our, our outreach, it has to be tailored and it has to be funded in ways that it's gonna reach the most vulnerable. Our food pantries should reflect the different cultures in the community. We bring to our families the maceta where they can make their pupusas or tortillas, and that is huge to, to be able to maintain that part of your culture at the table when everything else is falling apart. That brings light into the household when you're living with 10, 12 individuals, all strangers, because that's the way to make ends meet with the rent. You're still able to eat your pupusa or your tortilla. That is something that still gives the family hope. Um, Overall, our mental health services are vital, not just for the current generation, but for our future generations. The number of children I see in our food line standing next to their parents as their parents are crying with our caseworkers who are triaging the line, is heartbreaking. These children didn't make it to the 250 jobs that we were offered this year for the summer, or their parents couldn't afford the child care center prices. And so here they are in our food lines and experiencing firsthand everything their parents are going through, which, as I mentioned before, discrimination, domestic violence, sexual assault, substance abuse, all of that is happening in these overcrowded apartments and their children are front row seats to all of this. They are witnessing it firsthand and it's heartbreaking. Our kids need the services more than ever. We want them to survive, Congresswoman, and we want them to lead our country in the future. Um, we need more funding in nonprofits because we want to make sure our families are going to the homes in their communities to receive the services that they would sometimes in government agencies. If ETA offices are more in our nonprofit organizations, our families can walk in feeling more secure and comfortable to speak with someone and be honest with them about their struggles. And we need to ensure that our nonprofits are able to hire the experts on the ground. Natalia, born and raised in Chelsea. I myself am a Chelsea girl. Our executive director started as a receptionist at Colorado. And that is what we call success. When we are able, our pantry, which by the way, we were never in the business of food distribution before, and now we are because of the need, we hired everyone who was coming to our office during the pandemic asking for food. Those are the people who are now running our pantry. And it's it's a different level of care and understanding of the needs when you get someone in the food line who's hungry and crying and lost and, and, and hopeless. And you're able to relate to them and support them and guide them because you lived it. That's just, it's, it's, un it's unbelievable. I'm gonna end with that, but I wanted to thank you because I see you in almost 
every week I see you in a different community. Thank you for being that congresswoman that's not just listening to stories, but coming out to the community and witnessing it and hearing from us directly. My sister colleague there, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Hi. Hi, good morning. Good to see you again. Nice to see you too. Wendy Zinn, Olivia East Boston, and I'm representing the Lime Sacred of Boston. Um, prior to COVID, we were always a provider for some of it and CACFB. So we participate in both the CACFB, the Child and Community Adult Food Program, and in the summer SFSB, Summer Food Service Program. Pre-COVID, we did about 870,000 meals. That was to our early education centers, um, public preschools, um, at-risk uh, after-school programs, and then summer programs. I am happy to say that summer uh, eats kicked off last week. I am also happy to say that at five o'clock on Friday night, most of the waivers have passed, um, <laughs> which is great news, and we'll, we'll just have to figure out how we uh, make sure that grabbing that is available for families to pick up. But we have about 120 summer food locations, and, and thank you to our partners here, Project Red, um, and the city of Austin, who helped make that happen. So during COVID, um, in 2020 and 2021, we did about 8.1 million meals. Um, just unbelievable um, how the PPS, the city of Boston, um, city councilors, everyone sort of came together look to see where in the city of Austin there were voids and where we needed to get sites to have food access. So um, really remarkable what we've been able to do with meals. We also, before the pandemic, we didn't, we didn't have a relationship with the Great Boston Food Bank. And I want to say on the Monday before the state closed, the Great Boston Food Bank came to all of our city locations thinking we would be a pop-up location. So um, over the, the first year of COVID, it was it was easy because our wives were closed, which is normally health and wellness and membership. So we were able to, at our Huntington Ave location, have a distribution center that moved to a DCR location in um, the fall when all, all of our sites opened. And I'm happy to say that in April of 2021, we opened a warehouse on McClellan Highway um, that is able to do three pickups uh, a week plus a fourth on the Thursday and Friday and we distributed about 4,200 grocery bags to many in this room um, at 45 locations citywide. Um, so uh, about 9, 8.1 million grocery bags meals. Um, so really incredible um, partnership. So thank you, Greater Boston Food Bank. Um, and I really wanna say it was really the city of Boston um, and other agencies like Boston Centers for Youth and Family, BHA, um, that really all came together to sort of plan what groups, whether it was churches, soup kitchens, um, community-based organizations. I mean, we only have 12 YMCA's in the city, so this was really a partner effort. Um, so really amazing. Um, not only do we do grocery bags, which does include a, fr a fresh fruit and vegetable out of the bags, but we also have a partnership with Open Comfort that has shampoo, toothpaste, floss, um, deodorant, all those sort of things, and also the Dignity Matters so that we have menstrual products for women as well that we're able to give out with our bags. And um, I'm happy to say that in the fall, we will have a mobile market on wheels, so families and individuals and seniors will have choice. It'll go to targeted neighborhoods where instead of bags, they will be able to come shop at the mobile market at absolutely no cost. Um, so that's exciting coming up. Um, I would say two things about how we were supported by both the state and the city. Um, the infrastructure grants that the state of Mass gave um, were instrumental, although I haven't seen it yet because of the chip shortage. Um, but we were able to purchase the mobile market and um, a big truck that does our um, pickup at the Great Boston Food Bank daily and then also distributes out to some of the organizations. And then I'd also say the Office of Food Justice that has been mentioned several times have been instrumental um, I know Catalina is here in a new role with Project Bread, but I think we talk to each other every single day um, for two years, um, and usually with Boston Public Schools um, included, um, just to sort of plan and, and what's next, and how can we make sure we get food to those that need it. Um, 
And I just want to throw one thing out that I feel like um, gets uh, doesn't get included, that I'm going to make it a priority to get included, is universal meals are awesome. We need it. Just community eligibility, that it is now a waiver throughout the entire state of Massachusetts is fantastic, but we need community eligibility for uh, preschool programs as well, so that toddlers and preschooler families are not filling out paperwork and they have access to food and that the uh, child care centers can actually work with vendors to get food, free meals to kids for breakfast, lunch, and snack. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jen. Hi, um, my name is Jenna Bavia. I work with Project Bread, which as you know is located here in Salton and supports communities across the state of Massachusetts. I'm the senior director of Project Bread's Healthcare Partnerships Program. It's an innovative program that was designed to address food insecurity through the healthcare system. Uh, we strongly believe that this is the type of program that should be lifted up as a national model at the White House Conference on Hunger, um, integrating food insecurity as part of health care and paying for it is a huge step forward in our collective work to permanently solve hunger here in Massachusetts and across the country. In April of 2020, as the pandemic was just getting started, um, Project Red launched this nutrition intervention through Mass Health's Flexible Services Program in partnership with three accountable care organizations, Community Care Cooperative, Boston Medical Center Health Net, and Boston Children's Hospital ACO. The program addresses barriers that people face to accessing food through a case manager who provides individualized nutrition support to patients that are referred to us. Since the program launched two years ago, we've supported over 5,000 patients. We work closely with these individuals for six to nine months to address the barriers to accessing food, providing case management with a coordinator who speaks their native language. We help them register for SNAP, and we supplement the resources provided by SNAP with grocery store gift cards. Again, focusing on choice to help maintain dignity and culturally appropriateness of their food. But food's not the only thing that folks lack in accessing an overall healthy diet. 82% of the individuals that we work with need basic kitchen supplies. Mm -hmm. Things like plates, cups, bowls, utensils, and in some cases, even a refrigerator. We also provide individual nutrition counseling with a registered dietitian, cooking classes, and transportation assistance to get back and forth from the supermarket. Our data shows that through this case management approach, we've reduced food insecurity among 25% of our patients and increased fruit and vegetable consumption by a half a serving a day. We've also increased the portion that are registered for SNAP by 12.4%. The program is impactful and should be a national model. We're currently undertaking research with Dana Barber to understand which of our offerings have the most impact and are sustainable to produce long-term reduction in food insecurity. And of course, that research will help inform future models. But we do know some key findings already. First, hunger is about more than just food. People need the skills, resources, and knowledge to be able to purchase, prepare, and store food on their own. Second, we need to improve the access to SNAP. Um, Project Red's own report, Barriers to SNAP, demonstrated that there are many people in Massachusetts who are eligible for SNAP but are not enrolled because of lack of awareness, misconceptions, and stigma. We also know that the value of SNAP needs to be increased so that patients can afford food for the entire month. Finally, the healthcare system is a critical entry point. We need to integrate food insecurity into healthcare and pay for it. When providers screen for food insecurity, they want to know where they can send their patients, and partnerships between healthcare and organizations like Project Fred are vital for making that happen. You asked what government can do um, to support our mission to end hunger. Of course, we always support increasing eligibility and SNAP allotments, but in addition, we feel it's important to recognize that inextricable link between food, nutrition, and health, and to make programs like ours allowable across the state and across the country by making food an allowable expense in programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Thank you. Thank you. Monica will hear from you. I um, I will be listening. I have to take a quick laboratory break, okay? <laughs> I'll be actively listening. Um, I'm not sure I was this song. Okay. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Monica Lamboy, Executive Director of Administration and Finance for Chelsea Public Schools. 
This last school year, Chelsea Public Schools served over 6,200 students from pre-kindergarten to grade 12. Approximately 82.5% of our students are low income, 85% are non-native English speakers, and 14% are very recent immigrants with less than three years um, in the country. Um, we had the good fortune to have community eligibility prior to the pandemic, and it has been a tremendous benefit to our families, to our teachers, and to our operation. Um, by having universal free breakfast and lunch without requiring families to provide paperwork, without requiring families to you know, scrounge for a few dollars in the morning, all of our children are able to benefit from breakfast and lunch each and every school day. Um, we know community eligibility benefits families because approximately 80% 80, 80 of our students take free lunch every day and approximately 30% take a free breakfast. And when everyone is eligible, as the Congresswoman says, there is no shame. We are all the same in that way. We are not differentiating between kids that don't have money um, for meals. Uh, we know community eligibility benefits our teachers because they know all the students in their classrooms have a full stomach and are ready to learn to the best of their ability. If a student is hungry, they can get some food at any time during the day at school. Community eligibility also helps the district operationally and it has provided a stable financial foundation from which we can enhance the nutritional content of our meals by offering scratch cooking, fresh fruits and vegetables, and locally sourced foods wherever possible. Because participation doesn't vary on the day of the month or when paychecks are coming out, um, we are able to accurately forecast how many meals we take taking each day. That data, plus good kitchen management, means we have very little food waste. We, in turn, are able to buy higher quality food with the amounts that have been allocated to us, um, which is more tasty, it's healthier, um, and um, more attractive to the kids. We have partnered with Healthy Chelsea at MGH for many years to monitor and reduce sugars, fats, and salts in our food. And I'm proud to say that our uh, food exceeds even the Obama nutritional standards. Um, we have been able to do creative things with, with our resources, monthly food tastings of fruits and vegetables for kids. They have opportunity to taste new recipes and give us whether a thumbs up or whether they don't like it. Um, we have participation in our high school students through the food core in multiple aspects of our offerings. Um, and I really do attribute that to the stability that we have with the community eligibility. Um, in terms of the pandemic, um, we knew, as everybody at this table knew, how important school meals were for our kids. So our schools closed on a Thursday, and the Monday subsequent we had um, outdoor meals available grab and go. Between March 2020 and June 2021, we served nearly 1.7 million meals, the majority of which were served outdoors in a grab-and-go format even during the coldest months of the winter. I'm proud of what our cafeteria team accomplishes each day, but also recognize that the systemic support we receive through community eligibility is part of the reason for that. And uh, the, the, the most important part here is that this is being recorded, <laughs> and we are capturing all of this. And so, although I'm sorry, I wasn't physically present in the room, um, I was actively listening. Uh, and, uh, and we will have this captured uh, for the White House, which is the most important thing. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm Hamilton here today, so for Gay Jerry, but I've had community servings. But my name is Liz Hattenbuehler, and I am the Food and Health Policy Program Manager at Community Servings in Jamaica Plain. We are a Boston-based nonprofit that provides medically tailored home-delivered meals and TMs to individuals experiencing nutrition insecurity and their diet-related illnesses in Massachusetts and beyond. We also have a job training program for individuals facing barriers to employment. Last year, Community Servings prepared and delivered 997,632 medically tailored meals to 5,059 clients their dependent children and caregivers impacted by critical and chronic illnesses such as HIV, cancer, diabetes, and kidney disease. This represents a 25% and a 44% increase in the number of meals and clients served respectively over the last year. Provision of MTMs <coughs> an important role in the management and treatment of diet-related chronic conditions driving healthcare costs. 
Katie Serving's peer-reviewed research has shown that individuals experiencing diet-related illness that participated in the MTN program experienced 16% lower health care costs, 49% fewer inpatient admissions, and 70% fewer admissions to skilled nursing facilities than matched control groups. So we urge Congress to modernize Medicaid and Medicare so that MTNs are a covered benefit for individuals experiencing nutrition insecurity and acute diet-related illness. And this can be accomplished in one of two ways. The first, by including medically tailored nutrition in the definitions of the mandatory home health care services benefit category and in the optional other diagnostic screening, preventative, and rehabilitative services category. And second, by adding medically tailored meals to the definition of medical and other health services in Medicare statute for Medicare Part B. While CMS current approach of using waivers and managed care authority to pay for MTM programs has created an important opportunity to include MTMs with health care contracts, it has also created a system-wide gap in coverage, leaving many without access to medically tailored meals. And as a matter of equity, we urge Congress to ensure that MTMs are a covered benefit within the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Um, and I think to speak to your question about ending hunger at various levels, um, the program has already been alluded to several times is the 1115 demonstration waiver on the flexible health, flexible services program. Um, and Mass Health has submitted a request to extend that. Um, and included in that is to continue and expand nutrition services by allowing for the provision of nutrition services at the household level. Broadening the scope of services to the household level what, um, is really important because what we know in reality, when food is provided to a single individual, it is often shared, shared with members of the household, which dilutes the intended dose of the meal provided to the individual. So offering meals at the household level would not only improve health and food security for the entire household, but would also provide the opportunity to put, collect valuable data on the impact of medically tailored meals when the full dose reaches the individual from whom it was intended. And thank you, and thank you so much for this opportunity to be part of the conversation today. Thank you for joining us, Joel, representing the Massachusetts 7th. Uh, very well. All right. My name is Ashley Tinkin, and I'm the director of the Housing Advocacy Program at CAS, which is the Community Action Agency at Somerville. And my name is Catherine Porter, and I am a housing advocate. Thank you, Congresswoman Presley, for receiving our testimony today for the White House's Roadmap to End Hunger. For more than 40 years, CAS has been Somerville's federally designated anti-poverty organization. The Housing Advocacy Program at CAS provides homelessness prevention services to low-income individuals and families who have to choose between paying rent, utilities, or buying food, a choice that no one in our community, nor in America, should have to make. Food insecurity is a gender justice issue. According to our program data, 73% of clients who receive food distribution services since 2019 are identified as female. The vast majority are single mothers who are black and brown. SNAP benefits are the largest food support to clients, but are often not enough to fill a pantry. The loss of pandemic EBT to households with school-age children comes at a time when food costs are on the rise which has been a devastating blow to those who remain disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. We employ a benefits specialist case manager whose job it is to help clients navigate through the bureaucratic difficulties of accessing public benefits for households that are often eligible but not receiving benefits. Low-income residents, especially seniors and non-English speaking households, often lack the technology or competence to complete the application process. Many fail to respond to time-sensitive communications due to juggling multiple jobs and responsibilities. And if found ineligible, do not understand the appeal process. While accessing SNAP benefits can be done in person, those barriers have increased since the start of the pandemic due to limited access at local DTA offices. Finally, we know that food justice is deeply linked to housing justice. Somerville, Lake Boston, is also the epicenter of our region's affordable housing crisis. The market forces of gentrification are causing apartment rents in the private market to rise 20 to 30% with no ceiling. Our housing advocates work diligently to deliver rental assistance to low-income tenants to make sure they don't have to forego food on the table in order to pay for their rent and utility bills. But we know that these are the impossible trade-offs that low-income residents are making. Even after working two to three jobs, living with multiple generations or other roommates to save on rent, 
and settling for substandard or even dangerous housing conditions if it means lower rent payments and food on the table. So in addition to the many solutions that are being offered today, we are urging the following. Decrease bureaucratic barriers to accessing public benefits like SNAP. Increasing participation in food assistance programs like SNAP can not only put food on the table, but it can keep families in their homes. CAS strongly supports state legislation filed this year to streamline state-funded benefits into a single common application, and we urge the federal government to do the same. On a similar note, expand accessibility and availability of DTA offices, given the technology, communication, and other access barriers that we've mentioned, access in public assistance, public food assistance programs should be available at people's front doors. Staff with culturally competent case managers who are trauma-informed. Mobile offices could be opened directly in communities of low-income residents, like public housing complexes, and offer assistance beyond the nine to five workday schedule. Finally, we need the federal government to work with urban communities on continued investments in housing production and energy efficiency upgrades, especially for a city like Somerville where the housing stock is a century old. While we recognize that rent stabilization remains a state-controlled issue, low-income and working-class residents are facing food insecurity and displacement due to the lack of truly affordable green energy housing on the private market. CAS will continue to advocate for local and state subsidies that will lead to the creation and preservation of deeply affordable housing. Thank you again to the Congresswoman um, in your office for listening to our testimony today. Thank you all. Uh, this is my, uh, my brother in the work of justice in, in so many ways. Um, and I just want to make sure we get you at the table here. I'm noticing he's the only man. Uh, <laughs> and, and although there are uh, some, some men I'm pretty upset with right now, you're certainly not one of them. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. Okay. All right. Um, please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you. Thank you, sister. My name is Conan. I'm the director of UC Farm. I really only joined the panel to provide some gender diversity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so before coming here, I, at the farm, I climbed the mulberry tree that we have and harvested some mulberries for all of you. You're at the table there. I have some purple on my shirt and pants to prove. <laughs> so, this is what nature gives us directly, and we can access it directly. There needs to be no cooperation in between us and nature, and there needs to be no label on the food. We know it's good, we can eat it, it's nutritious, so please go for it when you see that food table there. Also, we brought some fresh produce there with the help of the bags from the City of Boston Office of Food Justice, and those bags have fresh cilantro, lettuce, um, squash, and some cucumbers, and garlic chips, and things like that. So if anybody who feels like it is free to take some. Um, I'll just go directly to your questions. Uh, what should government do? Um, I think that in this country, there should be no food insecurity at all. And so government should keep working until we get to a point where nobody is so poor that they cannot afford health, healthy, fresh food. So this should not be something we do year after year. We just work on it until it's done. And there should be no food insecurity talk. Even if that means some nonprofits are going to go out of business. <laughs> That's okay, yes. So um, economic security, I think, is the most important thing that the government can do. People can't buy food because they don't have the money. And we do not pay livable wages to people. And somehow we're comfortable with that. That should be questioned. And we have to make sure that people have jobs and have enough income so they can buy food, good food. And within the topic of economic security, there's um, the, the capital funding appears to be available somewhat easily. The mention of food security infrastructure grant from the state was, it was made earlier. And we use that and city funding and some local funding to create a greenhouse so we can make, produce food all year. You've been at the greenhouse. So all year. And that kind of outcome is great, but that's still capital. Government is very reluctant to spend money on jobs. Because that funding, when it stops, people are going to probably blame you for taking away the job or whatever. There's some concern. But jobs are important. Livelihood is important. Government has to find a way to be comfortable with funding jobs, at least in food security. So what we did during the COVID pandemic was 
uh, you asked the question, how do people find out about food sources, right? And um, we asked the same question when somebody walks at EC Farms, how did you find out about us? And the most common answer was word of mouth. I heard it from my neighbor, I heard it from a friend, I heard it from a family member. So we follow that route. And what we do to get creative about increasing reach through word of mouth is employ the very people that show up looking for food. And through them, we're able to reach more, more people. So the stipends for folks like that, part-time jobs and things like that, have been very, very effective. In fact, modeled on what EC Farm um, did and is continuing to do, um, State Rep. Madero and the then Senator Bonkori filed two legislations, food justice with jobs and food justice frontline. And one, one thing that your staff could probably do is to look at the draft um, language for those two bills at, in the state of Massachusetts, and maybe parts of that can be useful at the federal government level as well. Food justice with jobs and food justice frontline. One is about how to create jobs in order to achieve food justice while paying attention to environmental justice as well. And the other one is how to enable these frontline organizations who are the ones to step up and do the work when, as needed during COVID. So the other thing that government can do is achieve community connectedness through open spaces, which we find is great for place making. People can come together, meet each other, and people are more connected. They're able to help each other out. We don't even need so much federal or state funding when we're able to help each other because there's enough inequities in our communities. And if we kind of balance that out, we can even sustain that to a certain extent at least. So that is achieved through connections. We do a CSA, for example, where people who can afford buy at market rate, that is then used to create CSAs that are free for others who can't afford. And when you show up at Easty Farm to pick up your CSA, you don't know whether you pay full amount, half amount, or no amount, because there's a bag with your name, and nobody knows about your income levels. And so there needs to be no stigma, no fear. You just come pick up your bag and leave. And that's made possible because of these programs that connect different sectors of the population as opposed to just focusing on one. Nobody wants to be an organization where people only go to get food aid. I don't, I don't think, because people don't, some people don't want to be seen there as somebody who requires that, who requires aid. But if you're catering the whole community, people find it easier to show up. So ecosystems protection, I would say, is the third thing, but the big, big, big thing that the government should focus on we can't ignore environmental justice in the name of food justice or social justice. I believe you've made that point yourself when community choice energy was being discussed and the city administration was saying something about this is gonna to cost too much for some folks and you said, but it's also gonna affect them, the same, very same people. So let's get on the solar panels, let's get on the community choice energy. I really appreciated that point that, that you made. Thank you. So besides that, um, I would say in education, there has to be food systems education. Students have to learn about what's good food, what is healthy for them, and it, there are many studies that show that when kids are involved in growing food, they're more interested in experimenting with eating the food that they grew. And so that, I think modifying our education system to improve climate education as well as food systems education is something the government can do as well. Thank you. Actually, um, uh, just uh, some quick comments, and then I'll put one question up, and then we'll transition, okay? Um, so again, thank you all. Just thank you uh, for the role that you were playing pre-pandemic and the role that you continue to play. Thank you for lending your expertise. Thank you for being instructive and uh, prescriptive. And um, I was speaking earlier about uh, farmers markets and uh, the collective efforts by, by many of us to uh, increase uh, access and eligibility and to make those uh, you know, more affordable, um, particularly to communities that uh, historically uh, with um, a chronic disease and health disparities. I'll never forget talking to a family uh, that was uh, grateful that they could uh, now afford to purchase food from the farmer's market, but then embarrassed to share that they, they actually didn't know how to cook. And they did not have uh, any, any, because they didn't cook, because it is um, expensive to eat healthy, um, they were mostly eating fast food and, and did not have those skills. Well, um, this was um, 
the sobering uh, confirmation of that fact, uh, that, that that challenge still persists. But that uh, many of you, by having a more holistic and integrated approach, have been able to get at that. So again, I thank you for the solution that you offered uh, for how we can end hunger, because this is a 100% solvable problem. This is solvable. And while I'm also speaking to the need for us to get to those, those deeper, more systemic root causes. So, uh, thank you all. Okay, and um, our final panel, although the work will continue uh, beyond, uh, our panel number three, we'll hear from our advocates and my colleagues in government. This panel will include Dr. Shaw, Victoria Martins, Heidi Stucker and Mark Drayson, Dr. Sandel, Michaela Morrill, Allison Bobo Ammon, Laura Bell Rivas and at-large Boston City Councilor Aaron Murphy. Thank you for joining us. No bias, just an observation. Okay, checking for time. All right, and so we have um, we have uh, about uh, 20 minutes, okay? And um, thank all of you for joining us. We'll we'll start um, from left to right, your left, and I'll offer some questions for your consideration. How can the federal government support innovative strategies to end hunger? And are there gaps in data collection that need to be prioritized? to address hunger, nutrition, and healthy eating. All right, so uh, your name and uh, municipality, your neighborhood, and affiliation you'd like to share, and then we'll hear your testimony. Absolutely, um, okay. My name is Michaela Morrill. I'm a um, proud East Boston resident, although I'm currently representing Boston University. I'm not sure if that's in your district or not, but um, I'm the Director of External Relations at NBDPU. It's a, um, university-wide innovation center and where we enable all these carriers to become drivers of innovation in every aspect of their lives. We work with all 18 colleges, uh, faculty, alumni, and staff. And I'm here today because I'm going to be recommending some solutions that were brought forward as part of a university-wide pitch competition that tackled hunger. It's called the Campus Hunger Challenge. And we did it in partnership with the Greater Boston YMCA and with many of the help of the, or with the help of many people in this room. So a community <laughs> challenge, um, we've run one over the last two years, and it's our NBABU partners with an outside group. We come up with a really big question, something that's a real world problem that's really important, and we ask students and alumni to develop solutions to this problem over the course of spring semester, and we give one team $10,000. The Campus Hunger Challenge was this year's community challenge. We partnered with the YMCA, and we asked students to come up with different solutions to ensure that 19 to 26 year olds in Boston did not miss meals. Why did we do this? A number of reasons, but first and foremost, Temple University in 2020 came out with a report, their Hope Center said that one third of college students were food insecure. They also said that an additional third drop out of college because of lack of food. Can you imagine getting to school and you have accomplished this wonderful thing and you can't eat? For BU, where we have over 33,000 students, that can mean that at any given time, 9,000 students are hungry. And that's just BU. There are over 35 colleges in Boston and within Boston proper that could be 50,000 people walking around the city who are hungry. And two of the things that became incredibly apparent to me during um, the run of this competition was that many students did not know that they were food insecure because there is this idea that, oh, it's a college thing to just eat on the meals. Oh, it's just the thing you do in college that you're kind of hungry and maybe you only eat one meal a day. Normal. 
Exactly, and the amount of students we had to say, no, you don't have to live like that, that's not actually okay in college, was startling. Um, additionally, most colleges do not track how many students are hungry within their campus. Um, so I actually have a very good recommendation on that in a minute, but that was startling to me as well. Um, the U does not know there's one college within the medical campus that counts, and we could not find another college in Massachusetts that actually counts how many students were hungry. So what did the community, uh, the Campus Hunger Challenge actually do? We asked students over the course between February to April to learn about the issue and then come up with an idea that addressed one of five things. It was access to and awareness of existing food security resources. Could they come up with new ways um, for inclusion of culturally competent and nutritious food? Did they have a new way of creating food justice, advocacy, and activism efforts? Could they come up with a new way to uh, redistribute surplus foods? And could they create new ways for equitable participation in food systems? We also give emphasis to replicability and adoptability of this uh, of whatever idea was. So I want to share some quick takeaways from the teams that participated. Our winning team created a one-stop shop on campus and created a toolkit for other colleges. So things like the SNAP on campus program would have a place to live and be fully integrated into the other services that colleges provide. Another group came up with a way to make sure that community bridges actually have support and could work within college campuses, and that there were ways um, to share best practices on what is pretty much a pretty splintered network from what I understand. One team in particular came up with, um, it's called the Food Equity Assessment Screening Tool, and it, when you apply for college and they're asking you like, are there financial aid questions, all this other thing, they don't ask you if you might need like, social services. And there's six questions the USDA already asked, and he was like, oh, we should just ask them. <laughs> and that seems pretty simple to do. So I think we're gonna try to make that start to happen. Um, but additionally, and it's already been mentioned here today, different ways to reduce the stigma for students um, was incredibly important, and there were some very unique social media tools that our students created. I think that understanding that you actually are, what does food insecurity mean? What do you do if you think it's you? Um, was incredibly impactful and I saw the realization on a number of my students' faces. Um, I heard over and over again that students wanted food that made sense to them because canned food in college campus, if you're lucky enough to have a food pantry on campus, most of the students have no idea what to do with it in order to have the tools and resources in their dorms to cook the food. Um, and I will say two other things that became incredibly important, um, increasing the data, so collecting um, how many students are hungry on campus. The University of Hawaii launched a student case of needs master plan, and I think that if there's any way to encourage or incentivize universities that get federal funds to adopt and create their own student case of needs master plan, it is a way to align what is currently being offered and identify the gaps in why students aren't using those resources, because a lot of colleges actually do offer things that students don't know about it, they don't know they're eligible, and there's not clear um, understanding. And then um, the SNAP eligibility requirements that went into effect during the pandemic that allowed for more um, people to apply for them, I think are really important. And in all of this, international students are not eligible for anything. And particularly here in Massachusetts, but across the country, international students suffer just as much as other students. And I think we have to do our best while they're here in our country to take care of them. So um, I promise to put more in writing and give more details, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to speak on this panel. Thank you for listening. Thank you, McKenna. I appreciate your testimony. And you know that is certainly one of the things that we want people to get away from this is what is the face of hunger? And, and again, people often um, minimize uh, just how widespread uh, and deep this is, that it is a transcendent issue, that it is affecting people from every walk of life um, and, and every socioeconomic level, and, and not just people in their elder years, which is often a narrative that people uh, go to. So I appreciate your ensuring that we're telling a, a more complete and inclusive story here about uh, who is struggling with hunger and food insecurity. Okay. Um, thank you, Con Congresswoman Presley. Um, my name is Nehel Shah. I'm a primary care pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital, and I take care of lots of families who are experiencing food insecurity. 
I also uh, play a role in our BCH Medicaid ACO, which has been working on our um, flexible services program that um, has been described uh, a couple of times today, and so I'll provide a little bit of insight into that. I appreciate this opportunity to share um, some of our learnings from the work that we've been doing at Boston Children's to address food insecurity. Um, I want to focus just uh, for a minute on children, and specifically sort of the experience of children who are hungry and to remind everybody that not only do the children uh, experience the direct effect of the stress and hunger, but they experience the indirect effect uh, from the, per, the parental or caregiver's uh, response and experience, right? So they are directly affected, and then they have the parental stress, the parental difficulty in parenting when they're stressed, and all of that, those are sort of the, they sort of take two hits from the family-based food insecurity, and I think it's important to remember that. The other thing is for children that there are these critical periods in development where if a child is exposed to adversity or to a stressor, it has long-lasting effects into adulthood. So if we think ACEs. about ACEs, yes, yes, exactly, ACEs, as well as sort of other stressors that are just related to being in environments that are um, difficult to navigate at a certain age. The, when you, um, so children present this opportunity for prevention. I feel like we haven't talked a lot or um, we haven't focused enough on prevention of food insecurity uh, in, uh, in families. And I think that there's a real opportunity as we're thinking about, you know, at your level, at, about policy and what the government can do. There are things about bringing more resources into households through existing programs as well as sort of new and disruptive programs around things like earned income tax credits or equivalents for families where they aren't working, but bringing money into the household so that then the family can decide what to do with these resources. Um, and whether that's, you know, being in the position to have the resources you need to pay your rent and pay for your food and pay for child enrichment activities and after school program or summer camp. Um, we forget that families that are experiencing this level of uh, social and economic uh, disadvantage aren't able to then provide their kids with other things that, uh, such as enrichment activities that other families are able to when they're not experiencing um, food insecurity. I, I want to, I'm trying not to duplicate things that have been said, so just, I, I want to think a little bit too about root causes and the role of systemic and structural racism in where we are today. We know in Massachusetts that house, black and Latino households face a higher prevalence of food insecurity than um, their white counterparts. And I think it's really, that's re represented in many places across the United States. And for us to think about what are those root causes and where is it that, the, um, that we can focus our efforts in order to um, reduce the impact of structural and systemic racism and its role in sort of the social and economic disadvantage that are affecting food stability, housing stability, energy security, all of these, what we consider the sort of social conditions that are needed for good health um, in, in children. The, at Boston Children's, we've been doing a couple of things in the food security space, and the first is the Flexible Services Program, which you heard um, um, described um, by our Project Red colleagues. In addition to the work around providing gift cards and kitchen supplies and education, we've also made a concerted effort to work with families to actually access uh, benefits and resources that for which they are eligible, eligible, but they're not already accessing, right? And that, whether it's SNAP, whether it's earned income tax credit, whether it's child tax credit, there are things that families are eligible for, but they're not getting because our systems are designed to be barriers and obstacles. And I think, so in this work, what we have done is have staff who actually specifically work with families to navigate this range of systems, all of which ask the families for the same information repeatedly, over and over and over. You know, they, they call this the kind tax for people who have fewer resources. You wind up spending a lot of time trying to navigate these systems that could potentially help you, but they are designed to make it hard for you to access the resource that you need. And I think um, connected to this idea of having efficient access to systems is a work that's been done here in Massachusetts around the common application, allowing sort of families to apply for services jointly, so MassHealth and SNAP. But let's expand that, include things like uh, um, utility payment plans and um, 
um, the discount rates and utilities. So think about how can we create efficiency for families so that they are able to access some of the existing systems um, that are out there. I, wanna, I have this short collection of things that we have learned in this work that I will say and then I will stop if I saw the green card flash. So the first thing is food insecurity never occurs in isolation, right? There is always, there are other forms of social and economic disadvantage that accompany that. And when we talk about food insecurity, we should continue to remember that in addition to that, there are other things that are affecting the economic life of a family. And that when we think about addressing these things, we think about coordinating access to these services so you're not just focused on one need, but that you're helping the family or supporting the family as they think about the other things that they need in their system. I think that there's an opportunity um, to focus on prevention and really focus work in childhood and specifically for childhood hunger given that the impacts can be long lasting and extend into adulthood. And we then have the opportunity to potentially prevent those impacts in adulthood if we focus um, on children. I think that there's, um, healthcare is a sector that is should be actively involved in addressing food insecurity. We can address it at the individual level with patients and families. We can address it at the community level. Boston Children's just recently, six months ago, partnered with Boston Housing Authority and opened a food pantry in, um, in a, a BHA development that has been um, a, a full choice food pantry and it has been an enormous um, learning experience for the hospital, but also a process in which we have deeply engaged the community to sort of make this a valuable community resource. Um, that leads to my third point around the inclusion of the voices of those who are affected, which you have done here today, but it continues to need to be part of the process, whether we're talking about sort of um, small nonprofit entities or large hospitals or governments that are looking at looking for solutions, we need to talk to the people who are actually um, experiencing this in order to um, identify solutions that would actually work for them and not just things that we think, oh, this might be a good idea. Um, I think the last thing is that, um, and it was mentioned by Jen, but I think it's a really important thing to emphasize. So the Flexible Services Program is funded by MassHealth. So this is an innovation where these healthcare dollars that are usually just used to pay for healthcare services are being used to support families who have housing instability and food insecurity. And a program like this needs to be evaluated. What is its impact? Or what can we learn from it? And then to consider this as a long-term funding stream for this kind of work. Because hospitals are in a position where um, they are connecting with children and families and adults who um, are food insecure and who may not present in other systems, right? So it's in this sort of frame of no wrong door, a hospital is one of those places. A school is another one of these places. There are places where um, access to these services, coordinated access to these services should be available for patients and families. Thank you. I so appreciate uh, you providing me uh, with the language and the terminology I've never heard before, but certainly um, I, I've seen the impact of this on um, our most marginalized communities and uh, of the time tax. So it, it, as if it is not already a burdensome and heavy enough um, to be in, in crisis, to be hungry, um, and then to have to navigate very onerous complicated processes. Um, so thank you, thank you for that and for everything else that you, that you offered there as well. Okay, okay. thanks. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Dr. Megan Sandel from Boston Medical Center, proudly in your district. And I just wanna thank you for you and your staff for organizing this today and, and with Project Red. Um, you and Representative McGovern have been real leaders in this and, and I think that we're really excited to be able to inform the White House Summit uh, we had the honor of uh, having Representative McGovern and the Rules Committee visit Boston Medical Center recently and, and really thinking a lot about, the, about what you always say, right? The people in proximity uh, to the pain need to be in the proximity to the power. And I think today, with that in mind, I'm gonna speak more from my clinical experience as a pediatrician. Um, one of my colleagues, Alison Bogalaman from Children's Health Watch will speak to the research that we know, but many times I say that my patients are my teachers and they teach me that hunger is preventable and that it is intertwined with deeper root causes of racism and economics. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of three themes that I'm gonna hit on today. Um, one is universalism, the second is equity, and the third is that 
structural factors are at the root causes. And so we cannot just focus on individual solutions, but we must look at the structural factors that perpetuate food insecurity and hunger in our communities. And so when we speak about lessons from the pandemic, universalism is one of those lessons. We made things available, pandemic EBT, school lunches, grab and go, things that we know work now where you don't need to have red tape, you make them available. And that is where I saw the difference on my patients. And unfortunately, I've also seen the difference of when programs are taken away. And so one example is I, I'm the co-director of the GROW Clinic at Boston Medical Center where we treat children from families that meet the World Health Organization definition of malnutrition but live in the city of Boston. And that translates to a five-year-old that's in three-year-old clothing. And what I saw during the pandemic was that a family who was struggling to get their kid back on the growth curve, mom had lost her catering job, she got the unemployment expansion, and then it was taken away, and I watched that child's growth flatline. So I saw how that policy played out on the body of a child. When we move beyond universalism, then we need to think about equity that those who are the most vulnerable should be the most protected. And so young children are important, but pregnant women, this starts in the womb. And we need to be able to make these critical programs with SNAP more universally available. I've seen the power of these programs. I saw a, a two-year-old that hadn't outgrown their 12-month-old clothes, and once we got them the navigation of the system to get their SNAP and their WIC, all of a sudden this child started talking. The child's favorite thing to do was to open the cabinets to see the food that was inside. And so as we think about that, those are the stories that stick with me about making SNAP even better to be able to afford a healthy diet to make sure that WIC goes to age six because I've seen kids waiting to go to kindergarten and they lose their WIC benefits while they're waiting. Or to raise the asset limits where somebody goes through the whole process and then finds out they're eligible for $12 of SNAP. Um, the last piece I'm just gonna say is that we have incredible interventions and food is medicine and we have led the country in that. And that we need to look at the structural root causes of these that create these barriers to people having the economic mobility to make choices for themselves. And so as we think about it, you know, rent eats first. And, and so to an extent, affordable housing or affordable childcare so someone can be able to earn a living, those are anti-hunger interventions. And so as I say, hunger is a disease, but it's also a symptom of another disease, which is racism and economic inequality. And so I urge you to, to tell the White House that this is a both and. We have to do the great individual level intervention, and we have to do the structural tearing down of the walls that keep people down. And that is gonna be the best medicine, and I just wanna thank you for your time today and appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you, uh, pun intended, for being uh, prescriptive. <laughs> um, uh, innovative, instructive, thank you for that truth telling. Um, and, uh, and also just uh, thank you for censoring our children uh, because they cannot advocate for themselves. Uh, and you are right, the most vulnerable should be the most protected. Okay. Great. Thank you, Congresswoman Presley, for gathering us here today and also for your leadership in fighting hunger here in the Commonwealth and across the nation. My name is Victoria Martins, and I'm speaking here on behalf of Project Bread today to recommend the enactment of a federal program to make school meals universally free for every child in the United States. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, <laughs> so Project Bread leads the Feed Kids Coalition, a statewide coalition comprised of more than 115 organizations, businesses, and community groups all coming together to advocate for free universal school meals here in Massachusetts. School meals provide an important source of food and nutrition during the school day, particularly for low-income children. They improve short and long-term health outcomes. They increase academic achievement, and they reduce social stigma. And research has also found that school meals are the healthiest source of food for all age groups, 
and that access to healthier options at school can position children to make better choices beyond the school day and later in life. However, the traditional school meal system excludes far too many students from participating. Here in Massachusetts, nearly one in four hungry children do not qualify for subsidized access to this vital source of nutrition. And they either rack up meal debt, or worse, go hungry. We have cited the data supporting a myriad of benefits of a universal school meal program in our written testimony, but perhaps more important than the data is the profound impact that universal access to school meals can have on a child's entire life. The tiered pay school meal system puts children as young as five or six at the center of difficult economic transactions. Many learn at far too young an age the stigma associated with their family's economic status. As an organizer, I'm really privileged to work with advocates who dedicate their entire lives to fighting hunger and to fighting inequality. I work with a remarkable teenage boy who's an incoming uh, freshman in high school this year. Um, and he grew up with a single mom, and he experienced hunger and the barriers to school meals firsthand. So despite struggling to make ends meet, their family did not qualify for free school meals. They did qualify for reduced price meals. However, even with that subsidized reduced cost, his mom often couldn't afford the meals. To this day, seared in his mind, are the yellow past due notices that the cafeteria sent him home with how the kids would make fun of each other in the cafeteria based on their meal price status. This experience has impacted him for life, so much so that he has dedicated his life to fighting in social injustices to ensure that no family and no child has to endure what they did. And while he's a remarkable advocate, we as a nation should have never put him in the position to be so painfully aware of his family's finances while in elementary school. Kids should be able to learn, explore, and grow at school, free of worry about where their next meal is going to come from. A hungry child simply cannot learn. Our coalition is working to ensure that every single child in Massachusetts has universal access to school meals as a part of the school day. But it's not only children in our state who need access to this resource. Project Bread and the Feed Kids Coalition recommend that the Biden administration support enacting a permanent universal meal program for all students in the nation. The pillars of the White House Conference are to improve food access and affordability, to integrate nutrition and health, and to empower and educate individuals to make healthier choices. Universal School Meals addresses each of these. Thank you for the opportunity to submit your com my comments and for all you do. Good afternoon, Congresswoman. Thank you for hosting this event today. My name is Georgia Barlow, and I am on the Government Affairs Team at MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and I work closely with our Public Health Planning Team. I'm here today in place of both Mark Drayson and Heidi Sucker, both of whom are unable to be here due to personal and family illness. MAPC is the regional planning agency serving the people who live and work in the 101 cities and towns in Metro Boston. We support municipal and community partners in planning on a range of issues, from housing and transportation to land use and open space, climate resilience, and importantly, public health. MAPC's complementary advocacy efforts advance state and federal policies in alignment with our mission to promote equity, prosperity, and sustainability in the region. Our public health department leads efforts to advance community health and health equity with partners and the team leads efforts to increase healthy food access and food security. Food insecurity and limited healthy food access are complex issues that are driven by systemic dysfunctions. Deliberate discriminatory policies and disinvestment over time have meant that BIPOC and low-income communities have been disproportionately impacted. The complexities of these challenges require diversity of solutions, many of which have been shared today. Any proposed solutions must keep a sharp focus on advancing equity. Social policies that improve economic conditions for individuals and families so that they can afford basic needs and thrive are essential for ending hunger. We support legislation that maximizes the impact of federal nutrition programs, including policies that close the SNAP gap and provide universally school free school meals. We also support efforts that increase individual and family incomes, including policies that establish a living wage 
and reduce the burdens of the burdens of the cost of child care. And we urge the expansion of such initiatives nationally. An exemplary effort in Massachusetts that expands community options for healthy food is the Department of Health Mass in Motion program. Food that advances equitable community-driven improvements for healthy food systems and public spaces that foster physical activity. We urge expand, expanded federal resources for this program and its replication in states across the nation. At MAPC, we believe that healthy communities are possible when they include grocery stores, affordable housing, education and job opportunities, a variety of transportation options, and parks to play and move in. Healthy communities are free from the impacts of climate change. We support creating these community conditions through our planning partnerships with our cities and towns. All of our social policies must work hand in hand with our housing, transportation, and land use decisions so that we can address the root causes of food insecurity. MAPC works with our cities and towns to draw the connection between expanded social services and these root cause conditions. Thank you for prioritizing these issues and elevating the ideas shared today. We appreciate the chance to join these panels of experts aligned in goals to advance health equity and food security. We will be submitting more detailed written testimony as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Gina, you know, I'm going to see uh, in an exemplary way, and uh, you, you were meant to be here today. You were supposed to be here. Good job. All right. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Allison Bobel Annan. I'm the resident of Jamaica Plain and the director of policy for Children's Health Watch headquartered at Boston Medical Center. Thank you so much for hosting this listening session and for all the work that you do in Congress. Children's Health Watch, we're a network of pediatricians and public health researchers committing to advancing health equity for young children and families by informing policies that alleviate economic hardship. And our nearly 25 years of research shows that food insecurity, even when experienced for brief periods and even at moderate levels, um, has lasting impacts on the health, growth, and development of infants, toddlers, and preschoolers as Dr. Shaw and Dr. Sandal so, so eloquently laid out. We also know that health inequities across the lifespan, including in early childhood, are linked to systemic racism and economic conditions like food insecurity and other health-related social needs. Our research also consistently shows the ways in which exclusionary policymaking and xenophobic rhetoric, particularly against immigrant families and communities, um, impacts financial stability and health outcomes. But the problem of food insecurity and health inequities is not insurmountable. As has been noted by many, many panelists on, um, today, there are robust federal solutions that are in, within reach. And our research at Children's Health Watch shows that prioritizing policy solutions that really address systemic inequities are key to reducing hunger. So these solutions include removing barriers and reducing the trauma and stigma associated with public assistance programs by creating universal access to key assistance. Expanding eligibility, including um, eliminating immigration status requirements, and increasing benefit levels across nutrition assistance programs so that people can actually afford a healthful diet. And then recognizing that food insecurity does not exist in a silo, as has been noted, Boosting incomes by increasing the federal minimum wage to a living wage and implementing a guaranteed income. And we can start with extending and improving the advanced child tax credit monthly payment, which I will return to in a moment. And finally, investing in upstream solutions that support financial stability, like affordable, high quality housing, child care, transportation, energy, and all of the things that families are juggling as they make their family budget. Robust federal re relief measures that were enacted during the pandemic really showed what is potentially possible. Our research on the advanced monthly child tax credit payments, uh, analysis of nationally representative data, showed that when the payments were flowing, food insufficiency, an extreme form of hunger, was reduced by 26% across the country, a feat that the Secretary Yellen called at the time a um, an economic and moral achievement that should be celebrated, and we agree. But then when we looked after those payments stopped at the end of 2021, we saw a 12% increase in food insufficiency. We saw that that um, those data sort of uh, level out as families received their the rest of their month the rest of their child tax credit payments when they filed their taxes. But we're starting to see in the data an uptick in food insufficiency again, really speaking to the fact that people need 
the, the boosted income, the money coming into their pockets to afford a healthful diet. So our children, our nation's children cannot continue to wait for incremental changes and nibbling around the edges. We really need bold solutions that respond to the systemic failures that we've been hearing about today that threaten the health and well-being of our country's youngest children. So thank you so much for, um, again, hosting this session. We will submit very detailed comments with lots of um, data points and, and policy solutions based on our, our evidence. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, Councilor Murphy. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, for your leadership and for organizing this conference, but also for being my Congresswoman. Thank you for that. Yes. So um, I'm Erin Murphy, the at-large city councilor, something I've been doing for the past seven months. But before that, I was a Boston public school teacher for 24 years and a mom for 33 years, and most of those um, years were a single mom, so I know firsthand what it is all about, about juggling. So, um, and I also want to thank you for putting me last, because <laughs> I was able to sit here and listen to all of the previous panelists. I thought, you know, the personal stories from the first panel of their own personal food insecurity stories were, were just great for me to hear, and I just want to thank them for sharing and being so brave. It's important, um, as you know, that when you're in this role, this leadership role, you have to really be with the people listening to what their struggles really are to understand how can we help with the solutions. So I just definitely want to thank everyone and the panelists after for learning so much from them. And what I heard over and over, and it made my heart full, is access and dignity. I heard that from so many people, and I think that is so important. And I say this all the time on the council, how we're a rich city, but we don't always do the best job at connecting our residents with the resources we know they need, and in many times we already have, so we really have to do a better job at that. Um, I grew up in a single family household, and it was food stamps that kept food on my table for many years. And that was back when food stamps came in a book, right, in the 70s, and they were food bills, and you were often held up in the line with your mom at Edward's because maybe it didn't go through the register correctly, and it definitely, I, don't, I didn't know the word embarrassment back then, but I definitely felt stressed when I would go food shopping with my mom. And we also stood at line outside the community center to get the big block of, it was never the same colored cheese my yeah. friend ate. <laughs> yes, and it was always referred to um, at school as the welfare cheese, so I, I know now as an adult that I probably um, made my mom feel bad when I said I didn't want my cheese sandwich at school to have that cheese because other people for somehow knew where it came from. Yeah. So this whole idea of access and dignity is so important. So it matters to me a lot. Um, and also so many stories here, and thank you for your leadership talking about school. I mean, as a teacher, I knew, right, back when I started teaching in the 90s before Boston got their act together and made all school lunches free, you were um, told to line your kids up in three lines. One were the kids who had the nice, great um, you know, strawberry shortcake lunch boxes, and they brought their food mail from home, which was great. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But then you were supposed to put your kids who were buying lunch with money in one line, and then those who were going to get free lunch. Mm -hmm. And they had to walk down the hallway mm -hmm. separate. I never did that. I often got in trouble, but I was okay about that. And the other thing that happened, even when food um, lunches became free, there's always a policy. You mentioned a lot about policy. If you get a free lunch, you would get a free milk. If you only wanted the milk, because maybe mom or dad made you the lunch and you got the milk, they couldn't give you a free milk. They had to also give you the lunch. I don't know if anyone knows this, but this is a fact. So the lunch manager, who often then would get in trouble herself if she didn't do this, so say little Aiden got in line and said, I only want a milk, she said, well, if you don't have money, I have to give you both. So then literally there is a trash barrel at the end of the line, and kids are throwing away their lunch. So I, I know it's packaged, so I knew it was clean. We're often pulling the lunches out of the trash to then give to those kids who and also felt that they were told they couldn't take the extra food or the fruit that was wrapped. So, we definitely have to do a better job at policy. Um, and we know that each year millions of Americans are impacted by hunger and food insecurity. 
and experiencing food insecurity at a young age can lead to lasting health concerns, especially when families are forced to choose between spending what little money they may have on, is it rent? I know you said rent fees first. I like that. That's true, right? Is it medical care or food? Is it paying the electric bill or food? Or, you know, and also for many of our kids, is it being able to pay the $10 to go on the field trip for food, right? For kids, is it getting those sneakers or being able to sign up for that camp, right? And not realizing that mom or dad had to make the choice or grandma between that or food. So when communities have access to healthy, well-balanced diets, we know everyone benefits. And this is why as the committee chair of public health, mental health and homelessness, and also, um, on the committee chair on the committee to end family homelessness, which many of you talked about before, but we know that all of these kind of work together, unfortunately. Right? If you're experiencing home insecurity, you're also experiencing food insecurity. So it's definitely a lot of work to do. I'm gonna to continue to work with every Boston resident to have access to healthy food. One um, more story about schools, when we talk about healthy food, how important it is. Um, all of the schools I worked at were near corner stores, and many kids who sometimes would come in late came in with that, everyone knows that little plastic, dark black or color um, bag, and then it would be the 25 cent juice, which was just sugar, and maybe the honey dip donut that was wrapped in plastic, and that would be their breakfast, and they often missed morning circle, maybe because they were coming in late, and then the cafeteria didn't want to let them have the breakfast after the time they came in, and then we all know after the sugar high they crash. So the healthy food is so important. I often partnered with like Lamberts and others to make sure we had healthy food all the time. I often say as a mom too, if you cut up cantaloupe, they're gonna eat it. If you offer carrots with ranch, they'll eat it. So we have to do a better job. And I know Mayor Wu has signed on with like a new contractor with the Boston Public Schools, so that's great that we're gonna go towards more culturally competent and healthy food that kids like to eat. I know I'm getting the sign, but um, just thank you for um, having me here. I'm so like, you know, humbled by everything I learned and all of the people in this room that you gathered. So I'm just looking forward to continuing to work with you and your team and everyone here to end what we know we can end. It's so important. No one should go to bed hungry and we shouldn't question why or how did you get there? It should just be access. We know we have the food. And I was a waitress too for like 20 something years of my life. So we know from all of these different places, food is thrown away when we have people going hungry. So how can we change the policies to make that not happen? And I know you will help us do that. So thank you for that. Thank you for your leadership and the sharing for the and I think that was a powerful and appropriate uh, final word. Um, thank you for sharing your own story and bringing your lived experience to this work every day as a lawmaker uh, and for eliminating um, uh, the various uh, struggles uh, that so many face. And so with that, um, because we do have to uh, return our space here, <laughs> um, thank you all for your participation today in what is a historic convening. So thank you uh, for your participation today. Thank you for lending your expertise, but most of all for bringing your full heart to this. Um, I want to thank uh, Zoomix, I want to thank Project Bread, and I want to thank my, uh, my indefatigable, indomitable, and dedicated a team with a special shout out to Sophia Abdeed in my office, who was the point. <laughs> and, and I don't have a gavel. Uh. Uh, but, 